Welcome, everybody, to another fun at-home table read. Tonight, we're going to tackle the unmade J.J. Abrams film, Superman Flyby. Ah, well, J.J. was going to try to make a Superman film, and we're going to see how that one would look today. Going through our cast list, we got a fun group today. I'm going to be reading for the role of Superman, but as our action description, we've got Mary Pat. He's hanging right down there. As intrepid reporter Lois Lane, we've got Angie. Fantastic. As Lana Lang, Katazor, and a few others, we've got Anne. As Jorel, along with the villainous Lex Luthor, we've got Hunter. Right down there, loving it. As Ty Zor and Jimmy Olsen, we've got Eric. Perfect. And as Perry White, Martha Kent, and a few fun others, we've got Jennifer. All right, well, Mary Pat, take us away. Superman Flyby, a screen by J.G. Abrams. Fade in, interior TV monitor day. Tight on a video image of a new telecast, except there's no one there, just the empty news desk. Odd. Suddenly, a newscaster appears from behind the desk. He's 45, rushed and unkept, fumbles with his clipped mic, hands trembling, it's unsettling. He looks up at us, trying desperately to sound confident, but his voice shakes. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching this and are not taking shelter underground, we strongly urge you, all of you, to do so immediately. Anywhere, anywhere you are, anywhere you can find. At this hour, all we know is that there are visitors on this planet and that there's a conflict between them. The Giza pyramids have been destroyed. Sections of Paris, massive fires are raging from Venezuela to Chile. A great deal of Seoul, Korea, no longer exists. All this man wants to do is cry, but he's a pro. We realize now that we've been slowly pushing in all along. Only weeks ago, this report would have seemed ludicrous. Aliens using Earth as a battleground. But that was before Superman. Turns out that our faith was naive, premature, perhaps given the state of the world, simply desperate. Something urgent is yelled from behind the camera. Our newscaster looks off, terrified. He yells something back, but it's masked by a shattering flying glass. The video camera shakes. A terrible whistle, then an explosion. Everything is wiped out of frame in the same horrible instant the scene goes to static. Exterior Gotham City day. The New York skyscraper is being blown apart. Literally one of the aforementioned visitors dressed in body armor and a sort of ninja's cloak along with a sword sheath containing a weapon we'll learn about later. He stands in the middle of a central now abandoned city street. Cars strewn everywhere. He's blowing, <sighs> exhaling with the force of a thousand hurricanes and flattening five city blocks in the process. After the buildings have fallen, a distant escalating whoosh can be heard. This visitor turns to look behind him and we quickly push in on his face. This Kryptonian's name is Ty Zor, a handsome 30 year old looking into the distance as the whoosh grows louder. Ty Thor's mouth curls into the slightest smile. There's a radical conviction lurking behind those dark eyes. What that conviction is exactly, we'll learn soon enough. Suffice to say, this destruction has gotten Tizor's the tension he wanted. Suddenly, we pull back two blocks away, angle still on Tizor as two red boots hit the pavement in the foreground like an NBA MVP coming down from a slam dunk, the whoosh coming to a satisfying halt. Ah, yes, we can feel his presence. And the camera starts to move around to the front of the boots, slowly rising, dramatically revealing the body of a 29 year old warrior, a warrior in a brilliant red and blue cape, billowing an icon on his muscular chest, resembling an S and finally the face, eyes awash with rage and determination. But our first view of Superman isn't the all powerful Superman we might expect. While well, fierce and resolute, this Superman at this moment is winded. His iconic suit shredded in areas, his sail-like cape slashed. Bruised and bloody, Superman stares ferociously at Ty Zor, two boxers in the instant before round 12. And for this one moment, it's dreadfully silent in the middle of this gothic American city. Two extraterrestrial soldiers facing off like wild gunslingers, 
Then with a sudden and powerful leap, Tizor lifts off the payment and blasts into the sky. Superman furiously pursues. What follows is a frenzied mid-air martial arts battle, the camera quickly orbiting around the two as they exchange deadly light and fast flows, powerhouse punches that would propel a battleship 200 feet out of the water. The Shalom buildings battle and chase, a brutal but equal battle of superhuman strength. Superman soars high above the buildings, then turns 180 degrees and swoops down, backwards somersault kicking Tizor. Tizor is thrown back hard into a giant construction crane that falls back, crashing into the streets below. Tizor is shell-shocked for a moment, sees Superman coming after him. So Tizor grabs the end of the crane and lifts it, swinging it as if it had been made in Louisville. He slams the thing into Superman, who is thrown out of control. We actually follow Superman in slow motion. Our angle straight on as he crashes through two floors of two different buildings, people running crazily through the halls to avoid danger. Still reeling backwards as Superman steadies himself, gets his bearing in midair, then God bless him, heads back in for more. Tizor sees Superman coming, his eyes fixed, satisfied. Tizor flies off, Superman gives chase. Exterior East Coast day, sonic boom, as Superman bullets after Tizor, both breaking the sound barrel. Flying south over the eastern seaboard, Tizor dive bomb. Superman follows to exterior Cape Canaveral Day. Rockets, shuttles, massive crawlers, and aeronomic tech. Superman leans, lands fast. We push closer to him. In this moment, sweating, panting, he seems like a savage hunt, hunter, hungry for a kill. A metallic sound in Superman's head snaps to the side, eyes fixed on a distant hangar. In a blur, the Man of Steel has left the, fr left the frame. Interior NASA, NASA hangar bay, a giant warehouse, rocket boosters and next gen machinery. Superman enters, scans the place with his steely eyes. We suddenly rush into Superman's eyes. Suddenly we can see what he can see. X-ray vision. Continued, imagine the optic nerve working like a frog's whip fast tongue, instant zoom, pushing through objects. It's almost dizzying. This computer-like x-ray scan and Superman sees across his face an access door ripped off its frame. Superman blurs through space and through the door. Interior NASA testing area day. Superman enters the long dark corridor. It's a dead end, but there are a dozen doors here. Tizor is in here somewhere. Superman stares down the hall, but something's wrong. His eyes aren't working as they normally do. Then a chilling whisper. Cal -El. Superman looks up. We see the fear in those eyes. Where is this quiet voice coming from? Blood walls. It's almost like we're human, isn't it? Determined, having enough. Superman hurries down the hall, powerfully rips off each door, searching the testing rooms, each filled with NASA gear and giant water testing tanks. Superman moves through the place, door to door. He finally rips off one door that makes him stop. We're tight on his face, his eyes wide with terror on what he sees. What? And although we don't see what it is, we can guess. And Superman almost gasps. Oh. Overcome with deep pain, Superman crashes to his knees, sinking to the concrete floor with a soft thud, an agonizing, confusing moment. What the hell is happening to me? His head hung low. He tries to crawl forward, but it's so painful. And Tizor's voice returns, forceful now. I want to hear you cry, Cal El, like your mother cried. Cry for me, Superman. And Superman finally looks up and what he sees is terrifying. His face covered in a repulsive blister rash, his eyes rolled back and bloodshot and Superman screams loud enough for the world to hear. Finally, we smash cut to exterior field day. Peace, nature, the only sound, the gentle brushing of tall wheat. A five-year-old girl, the picture of innocence, sits on the ground, holding a small flower. Her hair moves in on a soft breeze. Pull back to a massive long shot, the endless field adjacent to a thick forest. 
snowy mountains, hundreds of miles away, three moons in the day daytime sky, the whole image washed in a crimson glow. On this planet, their sun is red, and those words appear on the screen. Krypton, 29 years, Earth years earlier. We're tied again on the little girl. She picks up another flower, collecting them. She's so adorable, you could almost watch her forever. Then her head snaps. She hears something we do not. A moment later, and we feel it, a deep, powerful, distant thud. Then another thud. She stands, looks off, worried, and another louder, deeper thud, crashing, snapping, rumbling, something fucking gargantuan is coming. As her face grows in panic, all of a sudden there's silence. The little girl's eyes dart around. What was that? Is it, is it gone? Will it crash? The girl screams in sheer horror as the 12 story tall war machine, a three legged walking tank, a rooster crashes through the forest, its fire turrets belching flame, immediately scorching the ground and the beast is headed her way. The girl runs, holy shit, does she run? Screaming her head off, screaming words, calling for her mother and father, but the words she shrieks crying are Kryptonian. Colosso, Colosso! The girl runs past us. We pan to re reveal her distant, doomed, unearthly home. And we realize this is borderland, her house set amidst Normal walls, fences, barriers that resemble tank stops. The enormous ruser mech warrior charges forward, spitting its napalm in appalling bursts. And we boom up, looking over the horizon. There are dozens more of these beast machines coming, and the towering rusers break through the blockades. Automated defense mu munitions fire at the dinosaur tanks, but there are too many of them. The border is crossed. Interior Senate corner. Corridor day. A handheld camera races behind a Senate officer who sprints down a long corridor. The image is shaky and fast, and this building feels imposing. The design and map, almost Japanese in influence, combined with the huge scale of Soviet era government buildings. The officer bursts into Interior Senate Assembly Room Day, a magnificent meeting space, the heart of the political system. Eight species are represented here. 47 senior Senate members around a central lactern where four hierarch flanks their king, hierarchs flank their king. All heads turn to the visibly shaken out of breath officer who makes a dire announcement. Note all scenes on Kryptonian are speaking in Kryptonian, an actual language we will develop where subtitles are needed, specific dialogue is written. They've crossed the border into Darjin. The Senate members are stunned. They all inevitably turn to one man, and so do we. The camera moves on to re reveal Jor El, their handsome, rugged 39 year old leader who has been dreading this. Have we heard from Cass? Sir, the general is dead. Jor-El absorbs the devastating news, then suddenly vaults into action. Interior war room day. It's a panic in here. The bustling command center of their military, two dozen lieutenants, still eight species represented, talk over each other, manning their stations. Holographic monitors show their damage is being done. Complex symbols and diagrams indicating just how much progress the enemy is making. Jor-El bursts into the room, taking on the information as one lieutenant reports directly to Jor-El, indicating on the screens. They attacked at once from the east and the south. But the units of Mina were destroyed. I'm afraid those were decoys. Increasingly distraught, Jor-El moves to another screen, calls up other icons of their surviving troops, not many. We have no offense left. Jor-El looks at his lieutenant, enraged. The lieutenant stares back, anxious. Sir, look at our positions. Tell me you see a way out. Jor-El looks back at the screens. We move, we move in on him. As it becomes increasingly clear, his people, for the moment, are damned. Jor-El's eyes swell with tears. The lieutenant still fixed on his leader, truly wishing for a miracle, but the miracle that Jor-El has in, has, is far from a quick fix. Go to your family. 
Sir, my job is here. I... I'm ordering you to go. Go! A beat. Finally, the lieutenant nods and heads off. We're on jor now, alone. Looking off, his heart sinking as the sound of destruction grow louder. Exterior Taza, Krypton Day. A massive, glorious capital city currently under siege. Mech warriors crash through the streets, attacking, fleeing residents mercilessly. We follow one giant war machine, panning with it, revealing the city's palace in the distance. Interior Taza Place, Day. Jor-El hurries down a corridor, followed by his wife, Lara, who is crying, begging. Please, Jor-El. But he's determined as he walks. Lara, you knew this day might come. Th there must be something else we can do. There isn't. And she stops him, physically strong, yelling, he's our son, and I will not send him away. Our baby. Dorel looks at her, his heart faring no better. But if he's not strong in this moment, there's no hope for the future at all. He embraces her, then quietly. My love, there's no time. He kisses her forehead, then looks into her red, wet eyes. He looks silently, asks, are you ready? She just cries, defeated. It's the best she can do. Interior launch chamber day. With a shockingly loud hiss, a portal opens and we're looking inside a transport capsule, large enough for one adult, but we are tight in on an infant. As he is placed on the cushioned interior of the capsule, this child, the baby Kyle, who will one day become Superman, looks up hopefully at his parents who are to send him light years away. The child oblivious, smiles at his parents, a still teary-eyed Laura has just reluctantly placed her son into the carrier. dor -El stands beside her. They look down at their son for a last heart-trembling moment. dor -El touches the baby and we see just how devastating this is for him. Look at us now, so that one day you might remember us. Then a distant thundering, the machines are coming. We see now that we're locked in a large observatory-like space. Dor L uses the holographic keyboard and the capsule's portal closes. We can see the infant inside through a window as the capsule begins to fill with a clear, thick liquid. Lara chokes back cheers as the oxygenated protective gel covers her son. She can't take it. Lara turns away. Jor El continues the operation in what must be some kind of nanotechnology. A metallic outer shell seems to grow around the capsule. Then the high ceiling slides open. The countdown has begun. Jor El goes to Laura. We have to go. As the launch alarm blares, Jor El stares out, returning for his wife's hand. Yells for her to come, trying desperately to maintain her sanity, she runs with him. Exterior Taza Place Garden Day. Jor-El and Lara run through the labyrinth gardens as behind them, their son's escape pod blasts into space from the launch chamber. They turn to look, the exhaust is bright. The force almost blows them over. Jor-El grabs his wife's hand. They keep running. Finally, they arrive at a dirt trail. A vehicle is there, a Zumba, a one-wheeled gyroscopic controlled speeder with a strange looking creature manning the handlebars. This is Taga. Imagine a turtle without a shell only as big as you are. Laura gets in the Zumba as jor -El talks urgently to Taga, who nods and responds, a devote follow devoted follower. Laura is aghast as she realizes what's happening. You're coming with me. You will see me again. I promise you. He grabs her face and kisses her passionately. A nearby explosion rocks the camera. jor -El turns to look at the palace. He then commands Taga to go far and fast. Targa revs the engine, vroom, races away. jor -El hurries back. Interior Taza Palace Day, it's mayhem. In classic wartime documentary handheld style, we witness two mech warriors crash through the entrance of the palace. Soldiers wielding powerful lasers, weapons fire at the machine monsters with jor -El landing, leading the charge. He runs past pillars, yelling orders to his troops, firing his blasters at the invaders. 
Dor-El fights with the enemy troops. His skills with martial arts and weaponry are magnificent. He skillfully twirls a blastiff, a three foot long composite pulse blaster that can fire from either end. Dor-El then switches weapons and fires what looks like a grenade launcher at one of the mechs and lands with a clank at the underbelly of the metal beast. Dor-El yells for his troops to scatter. He dives to the ground as the mech violently explodes, shredding everything around it. Smoke everywhere. Jor-El looks up and spots the lieutenant he ordered to return home, lying on the ground, badly wounded by shrapnel. Dor-El hurries to this hurt soldier who sees, seeing Jor-El says painfully, It was my duty to stay. Jor-El grabs the lieutenant, is helping him up, when suddenly something grabs Jor-El around the neck. It's a collar attached to a long wire, which suddenly goes taut. Jor-El is yanked outside. Exterior Taza place day, and we realize now this living collar is attached to one of the 12 story mechs. Dorel is now lying in agony on the ground outside the semi demolished palace, the mech's tower above him. One of his, in, this, its enormous smoking laser cannons only a feet above him aimed directly at him. Then all goes quiet. Dorel, bones broken, rolls over and sees, like a vision, someone step through the smoke. Only a few years younger than Jor-El, this Kryptonian apparently leading the enemy troops is Jor-El's brother. His name is Katazor, and he moves to his stricken older brother and looks down upon him. There's a familiar disease behind Katazor's eyes. We've seen it before in the eyes of his son, Tizor. Can you imagine what father would say seeing me standing like this above you? Jor-El just looks up at his brother with contempt. The silence infuriates Katazor. He leans in close in a tense, quiet, frightening moment. I know what you've done, that you've sent the boy off planet hoping to fulfill the prophecy, but I will find him, my brother. Katazor starts to squeeze Jor-El's face powerfully, painfully. Katazor leans in even closer. And these are the hands that will kill him. Katazor shoves Jor-El's face and stands, barking to his lieutenants. I want the boy! Sir, the pod could be headed for any one of the thousand planets. Send a thousand men. Exterior Katazor's military base day. Dozens of Katazor soldiers, hundreds of them, run across the tarmac to their pods. We see them secure themselves inside, hatches closing, preparations made. Exterior Krypton day, a shot so long you could see the curvature of the planet and suddenly the pods come. Hundreds of them lifting up from the Krypton, Krypton and dis disappearing into space, all headed away from their red sun, hunting down an innocent child who couldn't possibly know of the journey that lies ahead. Our music swells, it's epic. And then fade out. Fade in, interior Kent's kitchen day. Martha and Jonathan Kent eat breakfast. They're in their late thirties, a handsome couple, a good couple. Their farmhouse is modest and cozy. A large window beside the table frames, a view of their expansive cornfield, a timeless place. We hold on this one shot. Hmm, it's so simple, so mundane. Ah, these are their last moments of normal life. Good eggs. Oh, good. I'm glad you like them. I used that new cheese. You know, with the orange label. Thank you. You're welcome. Is Mr. Devaney still uh, coming by this afternoon? Yeah, I told him he was getting his check. He still wanted to come by at three. Then I might go out this afternoon. Well, I, I, I just don't like him much. Jonathan looks at her, not understanding exactly, when just then a twisted whine scream suddenly gets crazy loud and through the window. A meteor slams into their field five acres away, now headed for their kitchen. 
Exterior Kent Farm Day. The meteor screams across the field, plowing up the earth, dirt exploding everywhere as it barrels towards the house. Interior Ki Kent's Kitchen Day. Martha screaming on the track of an unearthly freight train. Jonathan grabs her, pulls her away. Exterior Kent Farm Day. The Kents run out towards a cornfield, yelling madly as the meteor thunders towards the house. A hundred yards away, they dive to the ground. Jonathan covers his wife, protecting her as they hear the meteor come to a slow, crunching stop. After catching their breath momentarily, they take a careful peek just above the corn line. The meteor stopped, <clears throat> peculiar, literally inches from their kitchen window. They're just stunned. Moments later, the Kens approach the thing. Smoke rises, dirt everywhere. A nervous couple. Careful. I am, I am. She stands back, a little more nervous than he is, when Jonathan gets to the edge of his new burnt out ditch. What he sees bewilders him, bewilders him. Good God. Jonathan jumps down into the ditch, Martha watching, and now we see it, Ka El's pod, like a giant metallic ball bearing, half buried in the earth. Sweetheart? Honey, you might want to stand back. Jonathan slowly approaches the pod, and as he does, his hair stands on end, a result of the pod's static electricity. Jonathan reaches out slowly, cautiously, and just as he touches the pod, its outer shell suddenly loudly retracts. The cats scream. <laughs> Jonathan falls back. And what they see where the metallic pod once was is a liquid-filled capsule now leaning against the dirt. Then the capsule opens. The liquid spills onto the dirt, and the nine-month-old Cal L is revealed. Jonathan is in absolute shock. Martha can't help it. She just starts to cry. She moves for the baby. The maternal instinct she never had a chance to apply surfaces full force. Martha? But she carefully lifts the wet, beautiful infant into her arms, holds him close, lovingly. Jonathan moves behind her, both looking into the eyes of this incredible child, pure awe, toilet paper. Then the baby sneezes, Achoo! it's a good thing you have toilet paper. Through her teary eyes, Martha smiles and says softly, bless you, <laughs> bless you. And on, on their astonishment, we pull back a couple instantly transformed into a family. Interior Kent's living room day. Later, perhaps the same day, the camera is on the floor as the, a ball of yarn rolls past. A moment later, little Kyle, now wearing a diaper, takes careful baby steps towards the yarn. Martha and Jonathan watch him. They're smitten, but it's still all very new. Kyle pick, kicks the ball. It rolls under one end of their sofa. The Kents watch as the adorable little boy waddles over to the couch, carefully bends down to pick it up, and with one hand flips the entire sofa into the air. The huge piece of furniture tumbles across the room. Exterior Kent's house day. The sofa crashes through their front door frame, flies off their porch, and into the front yard. Well, that's going to be expensive. Interior Kent's living room day. The Kents are literally in shock. Kyle has his ball of yarn. He's smiling. Interior Kent bedroom night. Little Kyle is set down on their bed. Jonathan watches him closely as Martha starts to undo the baby's diaper. As she opens it, we cut to a shot looking up at the Kents. We stay here. The smell of that diaper is stupefying. Jonathan covers his face with, with his shirt. Martha's affected too, but she keeps her act together much better. Okay, what in the Lord's name is that? Martha just starts changing the diaper, trying to act like what they're seeing or smelling is ordinary. Well, it came from him, so it's, it's beautiful. Jonathan is not nearly on the same page as his wife. Okay, honey, I think we should talk about this. You before, listen to me. Sorry. But before Jonathan can even start, she says, I'm very upset. You listen to me now. This child is alone. 
He has no family. He obviously didn't come from here, from anywhere near here. Now, yes, he might have certain sense and skills that other children of his age don't. Well, why or how that is, we may never know, but look at him. Jonathan, look at this beautiful boy. He's everything. I'm just saying, our sofa's on the front lawn. Then we teach him. We teach him restraint. We teach him how to control himself as parents. That's something we would need to do anyway. Well, yes, but normally our lives would be at risk. Okay, this boy is an angel, even though he smells like shit. Look at that face, those dimples. He's like a little movie star. He's like a little Clark Gable. Clark Kent. I think we should call him Clark. Just throw that diaper away. We can call him anything you want. Seriously, Clark's great. And a song begins, something moving but upbeat, something that plays under the scene that follows. Interior, exterior, Kent Farm Day. Jonathan works on repairing the front door and the porch. Inside, Martha carries around baby Clark, who's crying. She's trying to shush him, but he is, as infants sometimes are, momentarily inconsolable. Clark inhales and cries so loudly that all the windows in the house shatter. Jonathan covers his ears, suddenly surrounded by shattered glass everywhere. Hmm, fantastic. Interior Kent's living room night. About a year later, Clark's two now. He's running around the living room. Jonathan's trying to get him to come, but Clark keeps rambling away. Finally, Martha enters. Clark, come on, we have to go upstairs for a bath, now. Suddenly, Clark takes off, flying through the ceiling. Jonathan and Martha are shocked. Well, that's new. Martha Not bolts wrong. up the stairs. Interior Kent's bedroom night. Clark is there, covered in wood splinters and drywall powder. His parents teaching him a lesson. No flying. Do you understand that's right? Like us. You have to stay on the ground. Your father's right. No flying. As they continue to lecture, we're tight on this little face, listening and learning. Exterior Kent Farm night, bedtime. Push in as Martha reads a book to two-year-old Clark. Clark, without even knowing it, touches her hand. Aww. Exterior Kent Farm day. Clark is three now. He faces Jonathan 10 feet away like any three-year-old. Clark tosses a baseball at his dad. A few other baseballs scatter about. Good, excellent, nice arm. Jonathan rolls the ball back to the kid. Clark picks it up, throws it again. Yes, great control. You see that? Yeah. Okay, give it a little more juice, a little of that can't magic. And Clark curves the ball out of the state. Jonathan just <laughs> watches it go. Oh, God. Exterior Hub City Day. A loud, busy, multi-lane highway and a grand city in the distance. Out of nowhere, a baseball lands. Six cars and two trucks screech to a halt like mad to avoid an ugly crash. Exterior Kent's farm day, Jonathan tries to teach Clark, who is clearly nervous. Okay, not that much juice. I'm sorry. You don't have to be sorry. Just always remember, control yourself. Okay. And Jonathan hugs his son, saying sweetly, I don't want you ever getting in trouble. That's so tight. Sorry. Interior Clark's bedroom night, tight on our solar system. It's a mobile hanging above Clark's bed. Five-year-old Clark lies there staring up at the planets as if he's mesmerized by them. And the song we ends as we cut to. Interior Kent's bedroom night. Overhead, slowly moving towards Martha and Jonathan, who lie awake reading. So Clark made a discovery today. Yeah, what's that? 
He can see through things. Jonathan lowers his tractor manual. Incredulous. What? Yep. We were at the supermarket. Loretta Lang was there. Clark said, Mommy, why is that lady not wearing underpants? Which we all know is true about Loretta. <laughs> kidding me. That lucky kid. Martha hits him playfully. She smiles and kisses her. The kiss grows more passionate until very quietly. Not tonight. <laughs> he can hear us too. Not if we're really quiet. She looks at him, then to prove her point. Clark. Then from way down the hall. Yeah, mom. Jonathan. Go to sleep can't believe it go to sleep okay martha smiles goes back to her book off jonathan interior smallville diner night we move through this classic small town diner we find six-year-old clark having dinner with his mother at a booth what's striking is that clark kent has has had control so deeply ingrained in him that even at six, he's already an introverted, self-conscious, overly controlled person. Thought maybe that when uh, dad gets back, we can screen in the back porch. Yeah, that'd be good. But Clark's eyes are elsewhere, across the diner. Lana Lang, six, year old, six years old and adorable. She stands at the rotating pie display, just watching the pies go round. Martha turns, sees Lana. Oh, why don't you go say hi? No, Lana doesn't know me. There are only eight kids in your class, Clark. She knows you. Go say hi. It's a nice thing to do. A beat. Clark sighs, gets up, moves to Lana. He stands there beside her. Both kids just staring at the parade of pies. She looks at him, then looks away. Hi, Lana. You, you just looking at pies? Then Lana looks at him, not necessarily approvingly. You stir at the wall a lot in class. Yeah, yeah, I know. I just like looking at clouds and stuff. But it's just a wall. There aren't even windows. I mean, my own windows. She just uh, looks at him. You're the weirdest kid in class. This breaks his poor little heart. He forces a weak smile. Lana, come on, we're leaving. A beat, and Lana just walks away. Clark's left alone, deeply alone. And we pre-lap with. You are the least weird kid I know. Exterior diner night. The diner parking lot's adjacent to train tracks. It's dark out here. No one else around. Only a couple parked cars. Clark follows his mother across the lot. You just have some gifts that they don't. Which makes me weird. Martha starts to unlock the car. You're a normal boy. If your eyes are bothering you, I thought we might be able to um, have some special glasses made up with some Lead specks in the glass. Saw you inside. And the voice makes Martha jump a little as she turns to see Mr. Devaney walking out of the darkness. He's the Kent's landlord, a man we've seen, heard she's not crazy about. A big guy in his early 50s, short cropped hair, short cropped red hair, brown suit, no tie. Martha tries to hide her discomfort as he approaches but she always gets the feeling that he's undressing her with his eyes. Mr. Devaney, how are you? Drunk is how he is. Me? I'm fantastic. Uh, I'm fantastic. Uh, where's your husband? Jonathan's out of town. The distant bells of a train crossing. Really? Uh, doing what? Uh, getting alone? Get in the car. And Clark does, in the back seat. She closes his door. Clark keeps his tormented eyes locked on Devaney. You don't have to worry. Um, 
rent will be on time this month. Oh yeah? Uh, you're kidding, because hell froze over. <laughs> no one told me. <laughs> Amused at himself, Mr. Devaney has walked close to Martha, putting his hands on the car, preventing her from getting in. Clark watches nervously from the glass as Mr. Devaney leans close to his mother. I have an idea. You want to hear it? The train comes loud now, loud on the tracks. I need to get my son home for bed. I know the boy can stay in the car. Uh, we could do each other a favor. Mr. Devaney. Uh, we could say this month's rent free. Uh, how does that sound? I'd rather pay the rent. I see how you look at me. Little Clark's eyes are wide, terrified. Please let go of my arm. But Mr. Devaney kisses her. He, she tries to push him back away, but his lips go to her neck, his hands on her. She tries to move away, but he's being aggressive. Clark quickly gets out of the car. He grabs Mr. Devaney's jacket. Stop it! But Devaney just pushes the boy back. Get back in the car. He can, continues to attack Martha, who tries in vain to fight him off. Clark, in rage, rage lunges rage, at Mr. Rage. Rage. Lunges at Mr. Lunges Devaney, at Mr. Devaney, grabs him and throws him over a hundred yards across the parking lot. The park. Martha's shocked as Clark runs towards the man. Clark, no! The train still passes loudly. Mr. Devaney is wounded and disoriented as Clark, six-year-old Clark, grabs the large man and whips him into the air, then slams him into the pavement. Mr. Devaney screams. Clark then does it again and again. As much as the adrenaline will go wild over this sequen sequence, it become, it quickly becomes disturbing and bloody and all too real. Martha is screaming, begging for her son to stop the attack. Once the caboose passes and the train's gone, Mr. Devaney is a horrible, bloody mess. Clark is out of breath, spattered in blood himself, more afraid than anything. What's most frightening is Mr. Devaney's wide, terrified eyes set against his blood wet face. You, you're, you're, you're Satan. You're the devil himself. Martha takes Clark's hand, waiting only to get the hell, only wanting to get the hell out of there. But somehow Clark is fixed there, staring at this man who says words that will stay with Clark, potentially define Clark for years. You're a freak. Set from hell, you're a freak from hell. Let's go. And Martha drags Clark away into the car, screeching away all the while, Mr. Devaney yelling. That boy's a monster. That's what he is, a monster. Interior Clark bedroom night. Clark lies in bed. He turns away from his mother who sits beside him, stroking his hair. Clark's eyes are open, traumatized not just because he saw his mother attacked, but because deep down, he thinks Mr. Devaney might have been on to something. Continue. We slowly pull back from the scene, fade out. Fade in, exterior farmland day, white winter in Smallville, and that dot of yellow is the Smallville Junior High School bus. We barely make out kids singing embellished Christmas songs, i.e. we wish you a merry penis, at the bus pulls up at a crossroads. The doors open, the kids much louder. Clark, now 14, gets off the bus. Clearly not one of the popular kids. He wears glasses now, lead specs, speckled, thanks to mom, and is even more the class outsider than he was last time we saw him. As he gets off, he says to the driver kindly. Merry Christmas, Brad. Merry Christmas, Clark. The doors close and the bus driver, the bus drives off. Clark walks home, but he can still hear the kids inside the bus, even as it drives away a quarter mile down the road. Could Clark can't be more bizarre? <laughs> Not a chance. He's like a total psycho. He doesn't even play sports. His only friends are his parents. Clark keeps walking, but my now, he's used to this. But that doesn't mean he likes it. He covers his ears as he walks. 
In Tyr Kent's house day, Clark comes in stomping his icy snowshoes on the porch and pulling them off. Mom? Dad? Mom or dad? No one's home. Pushing on his face, he smiles and hurries off. Smash cut two. In Tyr Kent's bedroom day, Clark sits in the back of his parents' closet going through his Christmas presents. He picks up the wrapped boxes, shakes it, but unlike most kids, Clark doesn't have to unwrap anything to see what's inside. He just uh, removes his glasses and looks through the wrapping. We see his x-ray vision. One gifts a pair of sneakers, another's a microscope, then a sweater. Of course he's disappointed. There must be something better. Clark pulls over a chair, stands on it, and checks out checks out the elusive dark top shelf of the closet. He peers up there, hopefully, but there doesn't seem to be anything besides mom and dad's boring storage until he finds something interesting, something in the way back. He reaches for it and pulls it out. It's a sort of canister, a, a, a little larger than a football, metallic, smooth, looks somehow not of this earth. Clark tries to open it, but he can't find any way to do it. No latch, no screw top, but he tries anyway, pulling with all his might, and that's considerable, but it won't open. What the hell is this thing, and how is it so strong? In Tyr Kent's kitchen day, Clark sits at the kitchen table, eating from a container of chocolate ice cream and staring at the metallic canister that sits in the middle of the table. He gets to the last of the ice cream, his face a chocolate mess. And as he used his spoon to scrape the last of the ice cream into his mouth, in the foreground, the canister opens and Clark freezes. He just looks at the now open metallic football as if it were haunted and he slowly leans towards it, slowly, with nervous anticipation. He peeks inside. Something red seems to fill the interior, but it's a, is it a liquid or a solid? Rubber or steel? Then he touches it, and like a jack-in-the-box, something bursts from the canister, sending Clark onto his back. Standing there now in the middle of the classic American kitchen is our pristine Superman suit. Yes, standing there as if it were being worn by a powerful man, an adult powerful man. Clark, still on his back, is wide-eyed. Finally, quickly, he gets to his feet, more afraid than anything. He grabs whatever clothes, a whisk. He slowly walks around the shelf, self-standing suit. It seems almost alive. The red cape gently oscillating. Clark finally reaches out carefully and touches the cape. It feels thick, alien material. Then he feels the suit itself and getting just a little too comfortable, he checks out the sleeves. And suddenly something extraordinary happens. The sleeve sucks his arm inside up in to his shoulder. Clark freaks. Ah, help! He resists it, but in an instant, the suit, suit wears Clark. It sucks him inside as it rips off his clothing, and suddenly he's motionless. A 14-year-old boy wearing the coolest fucking suit you've ever seen. Only, it's 10 sizes too big. No way. Next year, Kent Farm Day. The front door bursts open and Clark steps out into the porch, standing akimbo. Behind these glasses, his eyes are melodramatically fixed on the horizon. Oh, he looks ridiculous. Except this really is Superman in the making. No matter. He runs off. Exterior road day. Inspired by the suit, Clark sprints. Watching the cape flap in the wind behind him, he is having a blast, getting comfortable in this second skin. And he runs faster and faster. And he starts leaping at first a few feet, then more. Then soon he's jumping 12 feet, 20. He can't believe this. Clark runs 40 feet, then he jumps again. But this time he stays afloat. 
to keep adjusting to keep him in the air like a living Aetherian organism. He quickly realizes the best position for his arms isn't perpendicular to his body, but straight ahead. And Clark just starts laughing as he soars into the sky like Tony Hawk without the board on without the board on half pipe. This kid has never been so exhilarated. He sails 2,000 feet into the sky, then dives towards the snowy field, stabilizing just before he hits the earth. Then he dives into the snow. Clark bullets under the snow, burrowing through the fields like an adolescent airborne mole. He bursts through the snow back into the sky. For Clark, this experience is celebratory, heart lifting. Then he plunges back into the earth, flying just above the snow, eyes closed. And just when he's having the best time of his life, Clark slams head first into his father's tractor. Poosh. The thing practically explodes into a thousand pieces. Clark wipes out spas tactically in the snow. Out of breath and stunned by the impact, he puts his glasses back on, then stands in the snow only to find his parents standing next to the car, having just arrived home. And ha, oh shit moment, if there ever was one. Sorry. Go to your room. Interior Clark's bedroom night. Clark sits on his bed, pensive, still wearing the too big suit and his glasses. The door opens, his parents enter and sit across from him. They're about to have the difficult conversation they've been dreading for years. Not the birds and the bees, guys. He watches them for a moment, then. I, I don't know where you got this flying suit, but it's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Is it not for me? Or it isn't the suit that flies. Yeah, the cape, but it's like handlebars, like the like steering wheel. Maybe the suit helps you steer. I, I don't know, but even when you were little, gravity didn't always work with you. The same way your eyes work differently than the other kids. The same way that you're stronger. I don't... I don't understand. Am I in trouble? No, oh no, honey. You know we both love you. Yeah. But what's going on? We are your parents. But not biologically. This news is horrifying. It takes a beat to sink in. I'm adopted? Clark, that suit, it, it came with you when you landed here. Clark doesn't realize his breathing quickens. When I landed here? What do you mean landed? You're not from here. Not from Smallville. Not from this planet. There are now tears in Clark's eyes. Where am I from? Don't know. Clark looks off, grappling with this mega news. The realization that all he's feared is being confirmed. He is a freak, a monster, perhaps the devil himself. Clark suddenly stands up, pulling at the suit, wanting it off, desperately wanting it off. Clark, wait. Clark yanks the thing so hard it finally separates and comes off his body. He throws the thing to the floor, then grabs what other clothes are there and runs away. Clark. Exterior fields night. Clark runs through the night crying, trying to lose himself, wishing he weren't himself. Running so hard for the long, for so long, he finally collapses in a snowy field, sobbing the deep, painful cries of a true outsider. And he looks up with his wet eyes into the infinite night, knowing that somewhere up there is a home that cast him away. The stars fill the screen. And after a beat, we slowly tilt down. It's a transition that takes us to exterior dimension desert, Krypton night. Nighttime in a cracked earth desert that seems to go on forever. 
Those three moons we saw during the day are grow glowing brightly tonight and amidst the nothingness is a clay and straw three room hut. Smoke rises from a makeshift chimney and these words appear on screen. Jamon Jamonin desert krypton, interior hut night. Taga, the turtle-like creature that drove Laura away cooks a grisly looking stew. He takes the pot over to Laura, 50 now, who sits at a table lost in thought, her spirit crushed long ago. Taga serves her without much enthusiasm. Laura thanks him in Kryptonian. She looks down at her food, her mind once again drifting, no doubt back to her lost family, when there's a strange sound. Laura looks up, Taga's ears perk up. It's something outside. Taga grabs a large self-made war club. He whispers in Kryptonian, shh, don't move. Taga sits, leaves the hut, we're extremely tight on Laura as she sits nervously, listening carefully for a long beat. Finally, she gets up and exterior Jumundan desert, Krypton night. Laura steps out, looks up at the vast empty desert. There's no one here. So Laura look, walk, slowly walks around the structure. It's like a horror movie. You just know you're about to be scared to death. Laura turns the corner and finds Taga dead on the ground. She turns to run, but one of Ka Katazor's guards is there. He slams her in the face with the butt of his blastiff. Exterior Yip Yispa Megacity Krypton Night, the universe's largest megacity, hundreds of skyscrapers, monolithic two story multifunction buildings, aircrafts everywhere. The words appear Yispa Megacity Krypton. Interior Yispa. Concentration camp night, a dark, immense concrete prison. Lara is led down the wide central corridor by three armed guards. She walks, scared and in pain. She glances into the cells. There are Kryptonians held there, those who once lived under Jor-El's tolerant rule. Now they're suffering, emaciated and sick. This moment is more heartbreaking for her than anything. Seeing her people in such a condition, her eyes fill with tears. It is just then that one of the male prisoners see Laura's. The stick figure man moves to the cell bars and calls out with reverence in a weak voice. The queen, it's Laura. The tears now rolling down her cheeks as the poor prisoners begin moving to their bars, seeing her and bowing to the woman who in their minds is still their first lady. The camp is filled with the prisoners, quiet chants of in Kryptonian, Queen Lara, Queen Lara. Lara. Headed to their own cell, Lara just cries as we pull back to reveal that this camp is enormous. This one wing, at least a dozen stories tall, there must be over a hundred thousand prisoners here. Interior prey chamber night, Katazor and son Tizor. 60 and 22 years old now, bow at the altar. Instead of candles, glowing wires like orange incandescent light bulb filaments surrounding the room, it's actually rather beautiful. An ambassador enters the room seeing them, hushed tones. It's the ambassador. I don't Your know. Your holiness, she's so. here. Tizor looks to his father who contemplates this deeply pleased. We also sense Tizor wants this job. Can I trust you with this? Finally, a nod from Katazor. Interior Zor-El cell, night. We push in on Superman's father. Jor-El's now a stress. <coughs> Jor-El's now a shell of a man. 68 years old now. He is a half hanging, his wrists caked with dried blood, chained to the wall behind him, scars and filth covering the former Kryptonian leader. 
He looks up as the cell door bursts open. Three guards come in, holding the wife he hadn't seen in almost two decades. He's in shock beyond speech as they look at each other. They shove her to the ground, holding her head down, execution style. She whimpers quietly. Then Tizor enters calm, controlled, holding an ancient sheathed sword like a katana blade engraved with Kryptonian text. I wasn't born yet. The day my father was overlooked, the day grandfather chose you for the throne and handed you this blade. Look what happens. Look where you are and look what I've got. Kaisor pulls out the blade. He holds it with the respect and skill of a master, bows with the sword. The proper technique just before its use, a whip fast series of swipes and Tizor is holding the blade directly over Laura's head. You need to find my cousin. Tell me where he is and your wife will live. Jor-El stares at his fucking nephew blind with rage and horror. Never! Jor-El's eyes flick to the defiant, terrified wife. My sweet love. Thank God we sent him away. I love you. I love you too. Where is Kal-El? But it's clear that Tizor, that his uncle won't budge, Finally, in a terrifying moment, Tizor raises the blade and strikes down. We don't see it, but Tizor has just murdered Lara. Jor-El, traumatized, stares at nothing. And we hear screams getting louder. And we cut to exterior Metropolis Universe Campus night. Six drunken screaming students goofing off crossing campus, no doubt en route to a party. We boom down to find 20-year-old Clark walking with his roommate, Jerry Shuster, a big, handsome fraternity type. Clark, true to form, is still wearing the glasses, is still the glasses-wearing introvert. Jerry, I don't want to do do this. I'm no good at parties. I don't have fun. How would you know? It's been four years, Clark. You've never left our room. Jerry's turned. He roughly, but kindly, unbuttons Clark's shirt, loosening him up. I'm getting Susan. I'll be at the party in 10. And when we get there, I want to see you inside, drunk, hanging from something, and acting like a monkey. I'm going back to the dorm. Jerry whips out a term paper. Clark's eyes go wide. Then you're not getting this back. Jerry, I have to turn that final in tomorrow. Then get your scared little ass to the party. Come on, you can do it. Still holding the paper, Jerry heads off, Clark sighs. Exterior frat house night, Clark walks up as a group of partying students walk past him. He approaches the house nervously. He stands outside, staring at the side of the house, drapes obscuring a view into the house. So Clark raises his glasses and uses his x-ray vision. We see what he sees and it's incredibly cool. As his eyes scan the house, it's as if portions of the exterior wall vanish, providing a view into the party. Dancing and drinking, lots of kids laughing, having a blast. Clark could not be less of a candidate. He looks increasingly worried about going in there. Then we push in on Clark as he sees something that makes his heart stop. A beautiful brunette girl standing in the middle of the party, looking somehow out of place. This is Lois Lane, incoming freshman, and she's standing there observing the outsider. We will come to learn that in many ways, Lois is just as much an alien as Clark. Clark watches her for a moment. She's in slow motion, but then a couple approaches her, a blonde girl and a big guy. The couple's been drinking. They're heading upstairs for some fun and clearly trying to get Lois to go with them. Clark watches as she declines. The blonde takes her arm, but Lois pulls away, making some excuse and heads for the back of the house. Clark, putting his glasses back on, adjusts his clothes a little, takes a deep breath 
and heads off. Exterior frat house, back porch night. Through the kitchen windows, kids party. But out there, there's, out here, it's like a sanctuary. Lois is alone, looking out into the night. Then Clark walks up the steps, a beat, then takes a bit of courage to get to. Great party. Sucks. A beat, Clark nods. <sighs> this isn't gonna work. He turns to leave when Lois says more to herself than to him. I cannot believe I'm here. Me neither, actually. This girl from high school, Abby Farmer, she and I are gonna be freshmen here next year. She said we needed to come tonight. We needed to network, but we're not even friends, okay? The only reason she wanted me to come was that she wouldn't show up alone, damn it. I predicted this would happen. Now Abby's almost unconsciously drunk upstairs with some 300 pound former Lincoln High all-star football donut head. And I'm stuck out here waiting for her to finish with him so that I can drive the three hours back home while she's passed out riding shotgun. Great party. Your fly's undone. Oh. As he does his zipper, she says frustrated. Oh, maybe I need to lighten up. Just chill. Try and network. Hi. What class are you in? What's your major? This is actually a sensitive subject for Clark. I'm uh, a senior and undeclared. You're an undeclared senior? Oh, that was a nice non-judgmental reaction. Uh, I'm sorry, that was rude. I just... No, I just... I don't know what I want to do. Yeah, that's all. I have some other questions I'm still working on. That's cool. I'm just one of those freaks who always has known what I've wanted to do. That's why I hate school and parties. I just want to skip it all and get on with it. Yeah. To do what? Journalism. I'm going to graduate in three years, move to the big city, and start writing for the Daily Planet. That's my plan. Maybe it's how she smells. Creepy. But Clark is in love with her. She reads his gaga stare as common skepticism. Skepticism. You think I'm peculiar, overly ambitious, too focused on the future to really exist in the present. That's not what I was thinking. Suddenly, the door opens. It's Abby and the big guy. Hey, so there's another party in town. Let's go. I'm not going to another party. The big guy takes Lois's arm. Come on, I'm driving. I said no. Leave her alone. The big guy turns to Clark, then pushes him. Excuse me, was I talking to you? But instead of killing the guy, Clark is frozen. He's terrified. As the big guy pushes Clark again and again, it quickly becomes clear that the over the years, Clark has been terrified into inaction. He won't even defend himself. The big guy pushes again, and just when it's about to get really ugly, Lois pushes the big guy hard. Leave him alone. The big guy turns to her, surprised. Then the big guy pushes her. Before Clark can even react, Lois slams the big guy in the face, followed by a fl flurry of powerful, sudden Krav Maga blows. The big guy slams into the porch, out cold. Clark is absolutely stunned. Abby is aghast. Now, how are we going to find the party? We are not going to the party. We're going home. Okay, you know what? This is why people don't like you, because you're not, like, normal. Abby storms off, leaving Lois, embarrassed and sad. Clark watches closely as Lois finally says, Take care. And as she heads out, Wait, what, what's your name? Lois Lane, the abnormal Lois Lane.
Good luck figuring everything out. She turns and heads off. We hold on Clark, considering this brief, life-altering meeting fade out. The sound of military choppers over blackness fade in. Exterior sky, dusk. A helicopter roars overhead. We follow it to reveal a normally sleepy desert town in the distance, 50 miles east of Mesla City. The sun sets behind distant mountains as words appear. Dust City, Arizona, seven years later. Exterior, Dust City, night. A dozen police cars are here. Emergency workers in a hazmat gear, cordon off streets, unspool yellow tape. A few dozen of the residents look on in the chopper lands. Through the swirl of dust, three black suited men step off the copter and move forward. At center is a severe faced 50 year old man with closely cropped hair. This is CI agent, CIA special agent, Dr. Lex Luther, flanked by dark suited formerly former Navy SEAL Gray and Burke. Police Lieutenant Hannah approaches Luther who walks briskly already unhappy. Dr. Luther, I'm Police Lieutenant Hannah. Thank you for coming. Two hours ago, we received an anonymous phone call claiming what appeared to be a UFO crashed in the area. We found the site and secured the perimeter. I've ordered everyone to keep a distance. It looks like there might be a body. Off Luther's steely reaction. Exterior crash scene night. We crane down the middle of the large field. Police weapons at the ready and the distant behind yellow tape smoke rises in the foreground. We arrive at the ground level to see a small crashed vehicle, pieces of metal strewn about. Some of the surrounding grass are on fire. This thing looks distinctly like a crash pod. Luther and the others stop at the yellow tape, a hundred yards from the crash. Luther fixes his eyes on the distant fire. We're tight on his hard, determined face. You wouldn't want this guy for an enemy. Luther quickly walks under the yellow tape towards the crash. Hannah holds up a hazmat suit. What about hazard gear? But Luther just keeps walking, leaving Gray and Burke behind. Ignored, Hannah uses binoculars to follow Luther. The residents, a few dozen of them, watch from behind yellow tape, many with binoculars too. Luther arrives at the crash, sees what looks like scattered pieces, scattered metal pieces and motor parts, and what looks like the bloody remains of an alien. Hannah and others anxiously watch him through binoculars as Luther moves closer to it, kneels, reaches out with his fingers and grabs a piece of red, wet flesh. The hell? Luther studies the flesh, then brings the chunk to his mouth and eats it. Ugh. Whoa. <sighs> Moans of horror and disgust from all who watch. Many wince and turn away. Uh, Luther, ign 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 indignant, walks back to the police and residents. Turkey and tomato sauce. The alien's a hoax. Tasty, but still a hoax. What about the ship? The ship's a Ford Escort. Stripped, disassembled. Actually, a nice job. Hey, whoever did this, terrific work. Who's the artist? The residents look at each other nervously. Then two beer-friendly 19-year-old guys step forward, bashfully proud. <laughs> it was my idea, but my buddy helped out a little. Yep. Luther smiles at them, then turns grim to Burke and Gray. Arrest them. Yes, sir. As Luther turns to leave, there's a camera flash, which becomes a black and white photo from a, from a below the fold story in the Daily Planet. The story headline, CIA spends millions on little green men, written by Lois Lane. Lex, I'm not gonna pretend this isn't bad news for you. Pull back from the article to reveal that we're in interior CIA director Dean's office day. A sleek, Langley office. Director Dean Dessler is a classic 60 year old skull and bones inductee. Lex reads Lois story clearly troubled. This obviously isn't the first experimental enterprise financed by the CIA, but those projects remained classified. This reporter Lois Lane, she has a source. 
She's printed it in its entirety, your division's mission statement. Lane was there? How did she know to be in Dust City? The hoax was her idea. Look, who questioned those trailer park boys? Turns out Lane paid them off. Paid, er, paid them to put the whole thing together. Lex, look, I'm not questioning your intentions or your integrity, but the CIA can't publicly acknowledge it spends taxpayer money on the hunt for alien species. We should pull the plug. Damn. At least until things settle down. I work. While idiosyncratic and difficult to quantify publicly, is significant, which would have been obvious had Lane printed the most important detail. Thank God she didn't. Why, Dean? We can't let some skirt with a press pass threaten this planet's security. I say we go public with the big secret. That could result in mass hysteria. Well, maybe a little hysteria is just what we need. Exterior, the Daily Planet Day. The skyscraper headquarters of the nation's largest newspaper. We're in the heart of the teeny metropolis, a city with very different feel from that of Gotham. Metropolis is a shimmering, vertical urban center, the happy combo of New York, Chicago, and San Francisco. Today's brilliant blue sky is magnificent backdrop. Okay, so keep paying attention over there. You got the sports desk? Interior, the Daily Planet Day. The sprawling newspaper office, 25 stories high. We're with Jimmy Olsen, a Brooklyn-born, somewhat effeminate 20-something photographer who talks to someone off camera. Those guys are all like old school boys club. Uh, you, you know you know what I'm saying? So unless you're like uh, Mr. Sports Guy, they're, they're never going to ask you to, to lunch. Never. Come, follow me. He heads off. Clark Kent enters frame, follows him. He's 29 now and is precisely where we'd expect. Given the life trajectory we've, we've witnessed thus far, he wears a suit, tie, hat, and thick glasses and is insecure as ever. He also carries a briefcase. The tour continues. Coffee room, okay, uh, for breaks and whatnot. Uh, microwave, sink, toaster, oven, uh, all the enemies of home, uh, this way. They move through the bullpen, an empty desk. This is your desk. And I had this fabricated, a uh, little gift. He hands Clark an engraved desk nameplate. Clark Kent. Oh, thanks, Jimmy. It's, um, my name's Clark. Clark Kent. Clark Kent. Oh. Let me ask you something. There's a woman I met years ago. She's a reporter here now. I wonder if... Interrupted by a massive door slam. Clark turns to see, turns to see on the other side of the massive space, Lois storming out of Perry White's office. Jimmy looks troubled. Oh, crap. That's her. And Lois storms over, furiously grabbing items from her desk, which backs up to Clark's desk. Clark's in the eye of the storm. Uh, we, we cover in an Air Force One or no? Or no. He said he's sick of babysitting me. He also used the words foolish, reckless, and amateurish. Well, so you're, you're asking about a Mr. White. He's from, he's from another planet. No, he's from another generation, which might make him a brilliant editor, but it doesn't mean he's always right. You should pay two kids uh, to, to fake a UFO crash. Uh-huh. The CIA didn't have to send anyone, but they did. I took a gamble, Planet got a story, and I get disciplined. We're on Luther's press conference. Is this Clark Kent? But Lois has walked off. They turn when they hear... Clark Kent! Barry White is here, the gruff, white-haired, fast-talking bastard, editor-in-chief. He shakes Clark's hand. Perry White, you know who I am. Yes, sir. Good. That's not a handshake. What the hell is that? Sorry, sir, I am... Um... Jimmy's got a better handshake than you, and he's got a boyfriend. That... Isn't that offensive? Yep. Hell yeah, it is. Don't you worry about your handshake. Work on your writing. You'll trail Lois and Jimmy for a while, and they'll show you the ropes. You've met Jimmy. Yes, sir. Give me this. 
Yeah, well, it's misspelled, and that's why he's just the photographer. Ha! <laughs> Get to work. Harry heads off. They watch him go. When I first met Mr. White, I, I thought he was just a total asshole. After a long beat, Clark looks at Jimmy, waiting for the revised opinion. Jimmy realizes. Oh, no, that, that's it. Clark nods, and we cut to photo photograph of a UFO. A grainy image, like the kind we've all seen before, and we hear. Ridgeway, Nevada, 1993. And then Lex Luthor walks in front of it. We pull back. Interior Global Center Day, an auditorium. 50 reporters ga gather to watch Lex, who is on stage where the UFO image is being projected. And for this event in New Zealand, there were 80 witnesses. All of them reported that the object reversed course, then vanished into the sky. Hundreds of thousands of sightings are reported every year. Most of them can be explained, weather balloons, satellites, hoaxes, but a few cannot. We see Clark sitting in the audience next to Lois. He watches wrapped. After all, he could be related to that thing. In the picture, Jimmy and camera are here too. I am director of the Special Operations Division of the CIA. As you may have read in Lewis Lane's wonderfully written article, the fact is that hoax was Miss Lane's creation, which makes me question her career choice. That's not how legitimate journalism should work. She looks down, humiliated, angry. The truth is, I'm relieved. We can finally talk publicly about what we do. A slide appears behind Lex, the CAA's SOD seal. Yes, the Special Operations Division seeks out intelligent extraterrestrial life. And yes, we operate under the assumption that those beings are a threat, a danger to all life on this planet. Clark shifts in his seat, a little uncomfortable. This division exists not because we're paranoid, acne-faced science fiction fanatics but because the CIA already has a UFO in its possession. Shocked murmurs from the crowd. Clark in particular is thunderstruck. Lois reaches and pushes, pushes close Clark's open jaw, saying quietly, Don't be naive. This whole thing is propaganda. Luther advances to various images, a capsule, very much like the one that Kael was sent in, lying in a swamp. I led the team that recovered this craft nine years ago. There's clear evidence that someone, something, was sent here, specifically to this planet. Yet no body was recovered, which means that it is still out there. Clark suddenly looks pale, like he might get sick. You okay? Uh-huh. So what is it doing? Is it studying us? Communicating with its planet of origin? Perhaps designing some sort of attack? Of course, there will be skeptics among you, but my job today isn't to convince you of anything. It's simply to inform you that we have evidence. There is a visitor hiding somewhere on Earth right now. We can't afford to assume it's nonviolent. And as we all know, there's no such thing as one cockroach. Clark gets up, a rush to the bathroom. Excuse me. What? <laughs> Clark? Needless to say, if anyone out there has information that could help us in our search, I urge you to come forward. Okay, pause. My computer just freaked the fuck out. Interior Global Center Corridor Day. We're tight on Clark, who is on the payphone, looking paled, edgy. Behind him in the background, conference attendees begin streaming out the door. He talks stealthily. Mom, it's me. Yeah, I'm okay, the city's good. Thanks, dude. How are you? Good, listen, that, the capsule, the thing I landed in, where is it? You sure? It's still there in the barn. No, no reason, just curious. I should go. Yeah, Mom, love you too. Clark hangs up and we push in on his puzzled face. What do you think Luther would do if he found one of these aliens? 
interior the Daily Planet night, Dolly, across the most empty office at his late at this late hour, Clark works at his computer, Lois at hers, open Chinese food containers. Don't tell me you believe that crap. What, the, the alien crap? A little. Clark, that press conference was classic reactive PR fiction. I wrote an article that embarrassed a division of the CIA. They only held the conference to justify their existence. There's no UFO. Well, wait a minute. What if, for example, just academically, what if there were aliens on this planet? Their eyes meet. Looking at him, she considers this for a long beat. Clark grows nervous, then. There aren't, I'm telling you. You can't believe a thing that man says. There's just something about him. You must have that sometimes. Instincts about people? Yeah, I actually had one about you years ago. We've met before, you and I. That MU, remember? party at Gamma House. You were an incoming freshman. I was a, a senior. Undeclared. It was first party. You'd, you'd driven in with a friend. Abby. We were there on the back porch. You, you were wearing a red sweater. It was like about 10, 16. Are you sure it was me? Am I sure it was you? Of course. We you beat up some, some guy. Oh my God, I do remember beating up some big guy, right? Yes. Yeah, he had a striped shirt, shaggy hair. Yes. And you were there? This is unbelievable. <laughs> I'm sorry, and you should know, I have a really good memory. It doesn't matter. I, I only brought it up because I wanted to say thank you. That night you said one day you were going to become a journalist and, and work here. I won't bore you with the details, but you sort of helped give me a direction. I did that for you? Clark smiles at her, grateful, a bit shy. Yeah. Her phone rings. She answers. Lois Lane. Clark works, stealing occasional glances at her. Yes, sir, the press conference piece is almost locked. It was? At the time? Yes, sir. No, sir. I won't blow this. Thank you. President's flight was rescheduled. I'm interviewing him tomorrow morning on Air Force One. I have to catch a train to DC. Can you please prove this? Done. Congratulations. Thanks. Jimmy's gonna freak. I'll see you later. She heads off, then mid-office turns back. Eureka! Your fly was undone! Yes, it was! He almost laughs, watching Lois smile and head off. Exterior Washington, D.C. day. Our musical score creates an atmosphere of power and anticipation. The National Mall, in all its glory, the brilliant white Washington Monument pierces the deep blue sky. Exterior Andrews, Air Force Base, Day. Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen behind her, moves through the security checkpoint. They then continue into a tarmac. We pan with them, revealing Air Force One under prep. White House staff and members of the press climb the stairs to enter the plane. Lois and Jimmy follow. Interior Air Force One cockpit, Day. The crew performs a flight check. Interior Air Force One, Day. Lois and Jimmy take their seats. She's trying as hard as she can not to reveal her giddy excitement. Then the sound of jet engines starting up. Exterior Andrews Air Force Base Day. The turbines begin to turn and we push in on an engine panel. At the front of the engine, it's loose, rattling. And on this foreboding engine image, we cut to interior Clark's apartment day. We push through the moving boxes that litter the place. And there's Clark asleep in bed. His radio alarm goes off, music plays. Clark hits the snooze button and within seconds is asleep again. Exterior sky day, Air Force One climbs to altitude. 
interior Air Force One day. Lois looks over her notes. Jimmy is putting napkins, menu cards, anything Air Force One into his camera bag. Lois sees this, says quietly. Jimmy. What? Come on, they, they know where we're going to take this stuff. A staff member approaches, talks to Lois. The president's ready to see you. Thank you. Lois gives Jimmy a look, then heads to the front. Exterior Air Force One Bay, the plane flies and the camera moves to the engine with the loose panel. We push in tight on the panel. It's shaking violently now. Interior Air Force One cockpit day. The pilots, as the plane reaches its 33,000 foot altitude, suddenly an emergency light flashes, a constant buzzing. They react, technical chatter. Interior Air Force One day. Lois follows the staff members down the aisle as the fasten safety belt light illuminates. Exterior Air Force One day. The engine panel rips loose as it's sucked into the turbine blades, shatter. The engine explodes and the plan banks hard. Interior Air Force One day. Lois falls to the floor. People scream as everything tilts to one. Everything tilts. One of the journalists on the plane phone reports. Oh my God, Robert, we're going down. Oh, we're in a dive. Interior Air Force One cockpit day. The pilots frantically try to correct the plane's altitude. Feverish radio calls. Exterior Air Force One day. The plane dives hard and smash two. Interior Clark's apartment day. Clark is unconscious. His radio goes off again. Force One is apparently having an engine problem. Clark hits the snooze again, is instantly asleep. Interior Air Force One cockpit day. It's mayhem in here. Alarms blaring. Engines two, redlining. Exterior Air Force One day. A second engine blows. Black smoke pouring from it as the plane plummets. Interior Air Force One day. Lois, terrified, holds onto the seat as she desperately tries to make it back to Jimmy. We now see the president, who's, who, along with his wife and daughter, are surrounded by Secret Service agents, all terrified. Interior Clark apartment day. Push in on sleeping Clark as the reporter's voice fades up. We are receiving information from a source on the airplane that Air Force One has lost two of its engines and is, at this moment, plunging towards Earth. Suddenly, Clark bolts awake. He turns to look and rack focus. In the apartment, the building across the street, behind a closed woman, a woman irons while watching TV, the news report. Repeating the breaking news, it has been confirmed that Air Force One is in a steep, uncontrolled dive headed for collision. Clark springs from the bed, his mind races. Finally, he realizes exactly what he must do. He turns to the moving boxes, scans all of them, rips one open. Under sweaters and sweatshirts is a canister. A whip of his wrist and the suit bounds out and into the middle of the apartment, standing there like it did before, but this time it'll fit. Off Clark's face, a wash in trepidation, we suddenly pull back at light speed to exterior Clark apartment say, outside his apartment, a long shot from across the street, we can make out Clark as he puts on the suit, as the suit puts on him. And in the same shot, we race in a blur up towards the roof as Superman emerges, blowing the roof across uh, the roof access door off its hinges. Then we quickly push in tight on Superman's face as he searches the sky. Through, of course, this is still Clark. His typical fear is overwhelmed by intense determination. And in that moment, he takes off into the sky. Exterior sky day, Air Force One spin dives, Two F-18s appear, flanking the flailing aircraft. Interior F-18 day, one of the pilots into the radio. Speaking of that, there's nothing we can do from here. Interior Air Force One day, Lois is trying to climb up towards the rear of the plane, tears streaming down her face. Exterior sky day, piercing the clouds, a human bullet blurring through the sky. Superman blasts across the horizon. For a moment, Superman stops, studying himself still new to flight. We push in tight on his face as his extraordinary eyes and ears scrutinize the sky. He hears the straining engines and he takes off again. We pan as we dart through the billowing clouds and exterior Boston day, pedestrians on Harvard Square looking upward. Look, 
up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. Oh my God, it is a plane. Exterior sky day. Air Force One can't recover. The engine's straining loudly. The plane spins, F-18 still flanking. Then the camera pivots, revealing Superman as he approaches the plane, as he reaches for a wing. The plane spirals, sending him tumbling. Superman steadies himself mid-tumble and dives again for the plane. His, he first grabs one of the wings and tries to stop the plane from spinning. Interior F-18 day. The pilot, having seen Superman, is astonished. No shit. Fellas? Exterior sky day. Superman strains, pull on the wing, stops it, stopping its spiral. Interior Air Force One day. Lois gets to a window, looks out, sees Superman for the first time as he takes flight. As he then flies back underneath the belly of the plane, her mind spins. Jimmy arrives beside her, taking pictures out the window. Exterior Boston day. More and more people in the streets stop to watch the skies, the plunging plane. Many run, terrified. Exterior sky day. Hoisting the entire aircraft on his back, Superman begins to lift the plane. Superman strains under the enormous weight and restores it to normal altitude. Interior Air Force One day. Lois is in disbelief. <laughs> she almost wants to laugh. The president and his family, relieved but confounded, look out the window, trying to understand what's happened. Interior Air Force One cockpit day. The crew reacts. Oh, Wally, good job. Guys, I'm not doing anything. Interior F-18 day. The pilot's eyes locked on Superman. Uh, is anyone else seeing this? I think so. Exterior Kent Farm, Cornfield Day. In the middle of the expansive field, Jonathan Kent, 71 years old now, brings his tractor to a stop. He's listening to his transistor radio. We push in as the new newscast is heard. And Air Force One, ladies and gentlemen, this is what they're reporting is being carried safety by to carried to safety by a man, a man with blue and red cape. Jonathan looks up amazed. Exterior Boston Day. Some pedestrians are running like mad. Others, most, stunned, frozen in shock as Air Force One is carried safely down into the city toward the middle of the Boston Commons by a man dressed in a full body blue suit and red cape. Interior Air Force One cockpit day. We put down the landing gear. Sure. What the hell? Exterior Kent Farm Cornfield Day. As Jonathan Kent runs across the field, back to the house, holding the radio. He's excited, anxious to sell Martha of Clark's extraordinary event. Martha. But as he runs, suddenly his face is strained. He drops to his knees. Something's wrong. We're tight on his face. Oh God. Exterior Boston Commons Day. The park in the middle of the city, countless Bostonians cheer wildly as Superman gently sets down the, pre the president's airplane. Yay! Out of breath, Superman looks up at the audience of pedestrians, yelling, laughing, shock, applause, and lots of picture taking. Superman, Clark, is so unaccustomed to this moment, such a super neophyte, that he's unable to enjoy it. Emergency chutes inflate and Secret Service agents begin sliding off the plane, followed by the president who moves towards Superman. Agents try to hold him back, but he insists. As presidents approach, he's cautious. Excuse me, do you speak English? Yes, sir. Well then, I'd like to say two words to you, son. Two words I've never meant more sincerely in my entire. Superman walks past the president over to Lois, who has just slid down the slide. She looks up. His hand is there. She takes it and he helps her to her feet. She looks up at him. Her breath is taken away. You okay? Me? She looks him down and up, stunned and grateful to the core. He's perplexed that she doesn't know who he is. Who are you? Who? I'll give you a hint. Fly. 
Yeah, I know. I saw you. How'd you do that? It hits him. She doesn't know who he is, baseball. Then from behind him, half a dozen reporters with still and video cameras hurry towards him. Sir, sir, in the red and blue, who, who are you? Are you a Republican? God, I hope not. Where are you from? What is your name? What, are you the alien we've been hearing about? What does the S stand for? Camera's going wild the whole time. The horde of reporters surprisingly irritating for Superman. He looks back to Lois, who stares at him beholden, captivated, but he's too anxious to say anything but. Excuse me. And then with a magnificent leap, he bounds into the sky. Everyone gasps. <gasps> then some people scream. <gasps> Others faint. <gasps> Camera's cash catch every moment, including Jimmy's. Miss Lane. Oh my God. Oh my God, Miss Lane. And we push in on Lois's wide, incredulous eyes as they watch the red streak in the magnificent, magnificent sky. A tear streams down Lois's face as we re relap. A truly incredible sight, just minutes ago in the center of Boston. In tears, CIA Lex Luthor's office day. We are tight on the video monitor as network reporters announce. The President of the United States flying aboard Air Force One was saved from certain, to death, from certain death today by an astonishing stranger. An image of Superman taken at the scene appears and we swiftly move around to reveal Lex Luthor watching with steely eyes. Beside him, Agent Gray and Burke watch grim. Push in on Lex as he watches, then with foreboding. Well, here we go. Exterior alleyway day. The dark brick canals of the city in a red blur, Superman makes a quick landing. Out of breath, his black against a wall, he looks around. Is he being followed somehow? No. He pulls open a steel, multi-locked door. Quickly peeks inside. Coast is clear. Interior Clark's apartment day. Front door bursts open. Superman quickly enters and locks the door. Still breathing hard. This is an anxiety attack. He quickly closes the blinds, then pulls at the suit. It rips off his body, landing, standing in the middle of the apartment. Smash cut to interior Clark's bathroom shower day. Clark takes a steamy shower, his heart still pounding. Interior Clark's apartment day. Clark sits naked in a chair, hunched over, rocking, his mind racing. 30 minutes ago, he was sleeping, entirely unprepared that today was the day he would reveal himself to the world. And now he sits here, somehow unafraid, his mind racing, knowing his life will never be the same. Then the phone rings. He looks at the phone nervous for a moment, then answers it. Hello? Clark? Mom, you saw the news. You can't tell anyone that was me. Do you understand? No one. Will you tell dad? Sweetheart, your father's passed away. On Clark, the awful words landing, we start to hear Chinese. It's a broadcast and we cut to interior video monitor day. The Chinese newscast is just the first of the series of international news reports, French, Japanese, Russian, Hebrew. We see the monumental impact Superman has made. Then a BBC report behind the BBC newscaster, an image of Superman and the words, the stranger. And given the American government's recent UFO revelations, it could be from another planet. Regardless, in this age of, hyper in this age of hyperbole, it's refreshing to simply be honest to report that today, a miracle occurred. Exterior Earth night our planet floating in space. We pull away from it as the sounds of an international newscast continues. The planet shrinks from view, the newscast overlapping. Soon it's a cacophony, forever transmitting into space. The sounds becoming exterior Yispa megacity Krypton night, the roar of a small passing spacecraft, which reveals the megacity in all its hideous glory. Interior Koba Palace night, a central room of dark palace, illuminated mostly by the hazy city lights through the full height windows, the glossy floors and low ceilings create a slit scan look. Katazor sits at a small game table, flanked by two semi-clad Kryptonian females. He smokes from a Kryptonian bong and plays an age-old Kryptonian board game called Swago, chess on four levels, the pieces hovering in space, moved with a touchpad at the base. 
His opponent is a thin, brilliant, but skittish man. This, his name is Prejudice. Though we won't get to him until the next film of the series. The way Prejudice is dressed, it's clear. He is one of the concentration camp prison prisoners. Catazor finally finishes a turn. Prejudice nervously looks on, realizing that Catazor has made a bad move. What to do? Prejudice gives Catazor a slight look with his eyes. Catazor doesn't understand at first, then realizes he's made a mistake. Catazor, as if it were his idea, retakes his last turn. Prejudice nods at Catazor's genius. Tizor enters, inspired, tasting blood. We found Kal-El. Katazor looks up. He's been waiting for this for fucking ever. Prejudice had heard this as well. He's surely to be taking this information back to his people. Where? Earth. And I'd like to go. Kill him myself. Father. Please. Push in on Katazor as he looks at his son, the devil himself behind those eyes, and we cut to exterior Katazor's military base night. With a bowel shaking rumble, a combat ship, the Quar, takes off from an endless, grimy spaceport. Needless to say, earthbound. It fills the frame, passing by to reveal an American flag. Boom down to see it's atop a pole at exterior Smallville Cemetery Day. Heartbreaking. Intimate music plays over Jonathan Kent's funeral, a small cemetery on Smallville Hill, a handful of mourners. Martha leans against her tall son. Clark shelters her in his strong arms. Interior Kent, bedroom day. The mournful music continues as Clark stands at his father's dresser, staring at the framed photo photographs of his family. Golden light through the window, a bittersweet moment. Clark opens the wooden box on the dresser. Jonathan's two watches are here. Cufflinks, only used once. A few half dollars, a pipe, and a baseball. Clark picks up the baseball, holds it, flooded with memories after a beat. You hungry? Clark turns. Martha's in the doorway, wistful. No thanks, Mom. And she moves beside Clark and looks into the wooden box of Jonathan's personal effects. Finally. It's amazing, isn't it? The things we keep and leave behind. And she's picked up a small burgundy fabric pouch with a string tie. She opens it, pours the contents into her hand, five odd shaped silver pieces. What is that? A gentleman gave us those years ago. He told us that where he was from, each symbol represents a different principle. Let me see. One stood for courage, another sacrifice, wisdom, faith, and love. <laughs> Your father liked these, said they reminded him, of, reminded him about what was important as if he needed reminding. Clark stares at these pieces, then sadly. Did dad have his radio with him? Because of me, wasn't it? Clark, what you did was wonderful. I'm never putting that suit on again. Martha just looks at Clark, saddened. Exterior Washington, D.C. day. To establish prelap. What I'm proposing might seem unusual given the circumstances, but... Interior Appropriations Conference Room day. Marble columns, high ceilings, darkly lit. Lex, seated beside Director Dressler, who's visibly uncomfortable, addresses a half dozen elderly legislators, mounds of documents before Lex. Dr. Luther, you're looking for additional funding, military resources to locate and imprison this stranger, as they're calling him? Yes, sir. You want to incarcerate the man who just saved the life of our president. Sir, I'd like to remind you that as much as he may look the part, the being in question is not a man. He's an alien. 
We don't know anything about this man. He could be from France for all we know. Sir, I promise you we're dealing with an alien, an illegal one, and he should be treated as such. His ability to fly in the hundreds of tons shouldn't exempt him from U.S. naturalization protocol. I assert it's all the more reason to keep this unknown quantity in check, to examine him and keep him in custody as long as necessary. What the hell happened in your life that makes you hate aliens so much? A beat, then. Read my hypotheses and ask yourself how many of our greatest enemies were once considered harmless? The strangest motives are unclear, and that's dangerous. He may appear sympathetic. He may also be the herald of the end of the world. The legislators seem to be considering this, then. When I was a boy, my neighbor got a dog. Great Dane. Great animal. Giant animal. Scared me to death. One day he walked up to me. Licked my face. You know what I didn't do? Kick him in the balls. Well, that's a delightful analogy. Your proposal is paranoid. This is the first real hero I've seen since DiMaggio. You think I'm going to be the one to lock him up? Threaten him with the might of the U.S. military? Not a chance. Luther feels the burn of this consequential rejection. He looks over at Dressler for support, but Dressler isn't on his side either. He, set, he says, cutting him off. I'm sorry, Lex. You coward. Dressler looks at Luther, his real disdain for the doctor on the surface now, as Luther returns to the legislator. Think for a minute about someone you love. Now understand that by doing nothing, you are killing them. You might be a smart man, Dr. Luther, but you might also be insane. And you're an idiot. Dr. Luther. You want you out of this. Bring room. this alien into custody. Out of we this must room. Destroy this th alien threat. You're the only person going into custody will be you. I'm demanding the CIA dismiss you from active duty immediately. Session adjourned. As they all leave, even Dressler. As we hold on Luther's infuriated face. Superman! Interior, the Daily Planet Day. Lois excitedly follows Perry White through the office. He's reading the, her copy. The S. Yeah, I get it. I thought it was better than The Stranger. Do you think it's good? Don't ever ask me if I think it's good. You want on, You want to know what I think? Well, I think the Superman walked away from the president and directly over to you. And what did you do? You shut down. You froze up. The plane's about to crash. A man was flying. I was in shock. Well, get over it. You should have asked for the guy in tights for an interview. You did it. You blew it. Hello. I mean, change the second inconceivable to unimaginable. Lose the first paragraph. You don't need it, and you misspelled sinewy and valiant. I haven't proofread it yet. Yeah, well, next time, proof it, and you'll want to change it to former CIA Director of Special Operations. Excuse me? Lex Luthor was just fired. Get it together. I've got Griffith on it. Harry walks off. Lois mind races. The hell was he fired for? Interior, the Daily Planet, later day. Lois has rushed over to Jimmy Olsen, who is cropping photos of Superman on his computer. A friend of the agency said Luther was banging war drums too loudly. He wanted to have Superman incarcerated. I'm going to go to, I'm going to DC. Did Mr. White send you? No, I just don't trust what Luther's going to do next. Do you still have that shotgun microphone? You actually think Luther's going to talk to you? Not knowingly. Interior Kent's kitchen night. Clark sits at the table eating sandwich, lost in thought. He absentmindedly slides the silver pieces around the table, arranging and rearranging them. Martha is at the sink cleaning. I always meant to learn about our bills, how much we owe every month. Mom, I'll take care of all that. Don't worry about it. I'd ask, he always said, one day I'll explain the whole thing. You said that for 50 years. And as Martha kept talking, we slowly pushed in on Clark. 
Martha's voice fading as what Clark sees makes his eyes go wide. And then we see it. These five silver pieces are the negative space that make up the S on Superman's suit. Mom, who's the man who, who gave you these? Just a man. Truck broke down um, one night. When? Martha Ages walks, ago. Martha walks over to Clark. Ages ago. Must be 30 years more. Or more. He just came to us for help. He was such a lovely man. She sees the S on the table and drops the glass as she's drying. In Tira Kent's living room night, Martha goes through a photo al album. Clark sits beside her. Dad had just bought a new camera. I remember we used it that night. I just remember the three of us stayed up talking. He kept asking us questions about ourselves. I'd never met anyone more curious. Here. Martha's found a, photo a photograph of Jonathan and Martha and Dor L in simple American clothes. They sit at the, at the Kent's ta kitchen table. Clark stares, overwhelmed. Somehow this man's face is familiar. Tears come to his eyes. It's almost as if Martha intuits that this is Clark's biological father. Clark, what does this mean? It means it was no accident. It means I was sent here to you and dad for a reason. As Clark's mind tumbles, Martha moves close to him and says quietly, guiltily. Your father and I always told ourselves that you were here because you were the answer to our prayers. But the truth is, I always knew it was more than that. Clark, I think you're the answer to the world's prayers. Clark looks at her, challenged and afraid. Teaching you to resist your powers the way dad and I always did, trying to make you normal. I think that was all a mistake. We didn't make any mistakes. Maybe we did. We were always so afraid that you would be found out, that you'd get in trouble and then someone would take you away from us. No one's ever gonna take me away from you. What I'm saying is, it's okay. I'm not suggesting you give up being Clark, that's up to you. But I think it's time for you to be true to your calling. Courage, sacrifice, wisdom, faith, and love. Clark, go save the world. And we push in on Clark's face, knowing his mother's right. And as our music starts to build, monumentous, powerful, we cut to exterior Andy's dawn. We race through the clouds at the sun rises and we find Superman who flies with a determination we have never seen before. Now we're whisking around and soaring Andy's mountains, pushing in as Superman lands atop a mountain, an icon of freedom and bravery. But what is he doing here? He listens to the world's cries for help, eyes closed, and we hear what he hears. Distant screams, shouts, yells, cries, desperate pleas for help. And we're tight on Superman as he listens to the world, his emotions rising in his heart, breaking. And then, as if snapped out of it, he hears horrible thunder and then particularly horrible cry, men, Japanese, resolve to help, Superman takes off. Exterior Pacific Ocean night, a wild storm, 60 foot swells. A Japanese fishing boat tosses in the nightmare. The crew whose cries we've heard fights ferociously to keep the bo boat afloat. But this is a losing battle. And here comes the wave that will kill them all. And these men know it. In this very moment, crossing the threshold of their death, the fishing boat is suddenly lifted out of the water. They look up and Superman is there, straining to hold the boat, flying them into the sky. Superman carries the boat just past the enormous death wave. The thing licks the hole of the boat. Exterior docks Japan night. It rains hard, but this is safety. Superman sets the boat down on the dock, looking down at the shocked seamen. Superman gives a short salute, then he 
hears another cry, a woman this time Italian, and he flies off in a blur and exterior sky night. We fly with Superman through the night, across the ocean, through time zones and weather and into daylight to Italy, specifically. Interior Flora's apartment bay. We're in the middle of a furious domestic dispute. An enraged husband hits his crying wife. How dare you? He yells at her in Italian. Sadly, this could be any language. This man is raging. He could actually kill her. The husband moves toward the woman, taking all of his aggression. He throws a lamp at her. She screams. He continues to yell. And in the background, there's a flash of red, a piece of his cape. The wife, face wet and bruised, looks up shocked. Just then, husband moves for his wife, about to hit her again. When he suddenly grabbed from behind, yanked back powerfully, the wife gasps. <gasps> Italian? Si! Excuse me. And Superman lifts into the sky with the man. Exterior sky day. Superman races upward, holding on to the husband, who screams, terrified. At 2,000 feet, Superman drops the husband. The husband falls, screaming, terrified. Superman swoops down and grabs him. Exterior Florence Day. On a crowded street, Superman lands. He throws the husband to the ground. The guy is cowering now. Pedestrians freeze, shocked. Superman raises a hand as, as if he's about to punish the guy into the center of the earth. And the husband starts crying. Superman kneels to him and with his finger mentions, motions, no, no, no. The husband nods, understanding, still terrified for his life. Then the sound of a horrible explosion. Superman turns his head. He's the only one who hears it. He flies off and his red cape fills the frame, taking us to exterior Washington DC night, a rainy night. Lois sits in a rented American car, watching with binoculars, the front door of a brownstone. After a long beat, Lex Luthor exits the building, looks around, sees no one. He gets into this black sedan and drives off. Lois looks at a, looks a touch nervous, but she lives for a shit like this. After a beat, she puts her car into gear and follows. Exterior Peru night. Men and women scream, holding their children, running, for their red, running from their red clay village as the distant volcano erupts, spewing lava everywhere, destroying their fragile homes. It's a melee. Then suddenly there's a sound of a gale force wind. Whoosh. In the insanity, many don't even hear it at first, but some turn to look. And there from a nearby mountain, Superman blows at the lava, his powerful breath freezing the molten rock, creating a natural wall of lava that protects the village. The villagers see this hero literally saving their lives and they start cheering, crying, kissing their babies in possible shocked gratitude. Exterior Washington DC warehouse district night, a spooky, empty, after hours part of the city. Lex's car arrives at the old brick burnt out government warehouse stopping at a combination code security gate. After a moment, the gate opens. The car drives in and the gate closes. Rack focuses to find Lois's car, lights off in the distance. Inside her car, Lois watches, waits, then grabs her black umbrella and gets out. Interior warehouse night. Lex walks through the dark, scary, decrepit building. Exterior warehouse night. Lois tries to find a way in, but the only way is over the fence. She scales it, an athletic, determined body. Interior warehouse, meeting room, night. Lex enters the bare, dark, leaky room. Sitting at a table are Gray and Burke, Lex's aides. Lex sits across from them. It's a scene that's mostly dark, except for sharp moonlight slicing across their faces. I called this meeting because you've both been loyal to me for years, and I'm grateful for that. But I need your help now. More than ever. Gray and Burke nod in subservience. Interior warehouse night. A series of macabre corridor corridors and doorways. Lois, now wet, enters the building through an old steel door, almost rusted off its hinges. As she crosses the filthy cement floor, two rats scurry apart and she gasps, but quietly. Then she removes the microphone and small voice recorder from her bag. Interior warehouse, meeting room, night. Lex, Gray, and Burke. Lex talks quietly, ominously. His eyes are almost hypnotic. 
He's a fanatic, but he's wildly convincing. As you know, the agency has decided to terminate my position. This is a narrow-minded and deadly mistake, but not a surprising one. Interior warehouse, corridor night. Lois walks quietly, her back against the corridor wall, can barely make out a voice. She gets to a doorway and peeks around the corner. Through three open doorways, 75 feet away, Lex talks with Gray and Burke. Lois turns on the recorder, wears the earphone, and aims the microphone. She and we hear. Interior warehouse, meeting room night. Lex continues. I was a young man. I had a vision. The words were spoken to me as if by a stranger whispered to me. Images of what would come made clear in my mind. I began my studies with a laser focus. What seemed like lunacy to the average person was simply my fate. This vision told me that others would come hunting down this Superman, that there would be great destruction, Earth's darkest days. In the vision, I would assist the others, hand them what they came for, and in exchange, they would grant me supreme power over this planet. Lois watches, eyes wide. Luther's clearly mad, except that we do know others are coming. Assist me in this effort, and in exchange, I'll share with you that power. Gray and Burke look at each other in agreement. We're in. Good. What I'm about to tell you is red band classified. The alien pod we found years ago. A body was recovered. Tight on Lois. She cannot believe this. It was dead, killed on impact. But I organized top secret biological studies. What we learned was that a seemingly benign element changed the molecular structure of this alien. Luther pulls out a folder, slides it across to Gray and Burke, a top secret NASA file, pages of texts and some photos of phosphorus green rock. Lois watches behind her a few more rats she doesn't yet see. Kryptonite. Couldn't help myself. Kryptonite. A rock, one of thousands, plucked out of space by the Virgo space probe. Harmless to humans. Poison to the likes of Superman. A sample is on loan to the National Aerospace Museum. You retrieve that kryptonite. I'll handle contact in the just then, rats cross Lois's feet. She reflexively steps back, making a small noise. Luther and the agents look up. Lois, run. Lois runs. Agents Gray and Burke pull their guns and run after her. Interior warehouse night. A fast chase through the facility. Lois racing, slipping for a moment in a puddle. Gray and Burke running, searching, guns drawn. She runs through the exit door and suddenly an alarm blares. Exterior warehouse night. Lois sprints through the rain. Distant police sirens can be heard. She races towards a chain-linked fence, jumps, climbs, an alleyway and a garbage can on the other side. We're tied on Lois as she makes the climb and jumps down the other side. She turns and screams. Lex Luthor standing right behind her. He suddenly grabs, grabs her by the throat, straining, terrified. She tries to fight back, but he's too strong. He leans close to her face, which is turning blue. Did you get the story you came for, Miss Lane? Lex grabs the tape recorder and microphone from her hands, then looks at her with killer's eyes. Police science sirens getting louder. She strains to breathe. He gets even closer, his lips almost touching hers. Just wait. Let's see where this story goes. And just as we think he's going to murder her, he throws her down hard into the garbage cans. It's a painful landing. Just then, she's illuminated by halogen headlights. Two police cars have arrived. Cops jump out, aiming their pieces on Lois. Freeze! Lois looks up. Lex is gone. Off Lois, horrified, confused, out of breath, cut to exterior space night. The Kryptonian battleship Quar blasts through hyperspace. It finally slows and comes to a stop floating in space. The interior Quar night. A corridor of this dark, wet ship, tubing and rust, heavily controlled panels everywhere. A three-part corridor, three-part corridor 
portal loudly separates and four Kryptonians step through it. Tizor leads the determined quick pace. Who are these other Kryptonians? Two males, one female. We'll come to them later, but for now. They enter the deck of the choir, quickly manning four separate cockpit control units. They strap themselves in, use their controls to execute a well-synchronized set of commands and exterior space night. The choir separates, sections of the ship peel back like a banana, revealing what looks like a smaller warship inside. Elements of the smaller warship turn, retract. The thing transforms, and then we realize it's a rouser, one of their 12-story mech warriors. While the Quar mothership remains stationary, the rouser boot boosters ignite, it blasts away. Interior Quar night, and the four Kryptonians watch from Quar as the bruisers head away from them. We're tight on Tizor, who stares is intense and unwavering. On the cannons. We hear off-camera Kryptonian responses. Tizor's blood-hungry eyes seem sickeningly pleased. Interior, the Daily Planet Day. The place is a buzz in Superman talk. We see a headline, Superman saves thousands. Photos from Peru and Japan, Clark walks through, arrives at his desk. Jimmy's there looking over proof sheets. Ugh. Hey, how's your mom? She okay? She will be, thanks. Where's Lois? Uh, getting fired. What? Another door slam. Clark looks up and sees Perry White burst from his office wearing his jacket. Lois with a bandage trails. What upsets me, and this is the last time I will say this, is not what or why you do what you do, it's how. Mr. White. I am not a bail bondsman, Miss Lane. I am not a babysitter or a father or a very patient. I'm not even very patient. I want your desk cleaned out this afternoon. Lex Luthor is planning something to destroy Superman. Superman? The man you didn't interview? The entire newsroom stops. Perry gets very quiet. You're fired. Excuse me. And Perry walks off. Lois stands there, stays. Clark approaches. L Lois, I... Not now, Clark. Mr. White, wait a minute. Following Perry, Lois has left the main office. Clark looks off, his mind racing. Lois can't leave the Daily Planet. The pit in his stomach is back, knowing what he must do. Can you believe him? Clark? Exterior Metropolis Day. Perry quickly exits the building. Lois tags behind. Luther is a madman. I heard him talk about some vision he had. He thinks he, he, th he thinks he's going to rule the planet. And what evidence do you have of that? Your police record? You can't follow me around like this all day. There was a story here somewhere. Give me one more chance. Being a decent writer doesn't make you a good reporter. It's about the choices you make, about judgment. At the press conference, Luther said he questioned your, uh, questioned your career choice, recommended you follow his lead. This breaks her heart. She looks at Perry, furious, tears in her eyes. That was just mean. I didn't get where I am by being a sweetheart. Off Lois's sad, seething face, screech! She turns and half a dozen cars barely avoid crashing as Superman swoops down and hovers 20 feet above the middle of the street. Pedestrians go nuts, some screaming, others on cell phones telling whoever they're talking to that they're seeing him. Others simply freeze agog. Lois, about an interview. We push in on Lois and Perry, shocked. I was just fired by him. Now wait a minute. Superman quickly flies over to Lois and Perry and lands looking at Perry as if he's never seen him before. Superman extends his hand. Hi there. Who are you? I'm a... <clears throat> Perry White, editor-in-chief, in I mean, um, chief. 
Perry's wincing at Superman's powerful grip. You didn't mm-hmm. just fire this woman, did you? Mm-hmm. No. She's no. one of my favorite reporters. Which is one of the best. Superman lifts go of Perry's hand and moves close to Lois, his lips to her ear, and send this sends a chill down her spine. Tonight, eight o'clock, roof of the Daily Planet. Our secret. Our secret. Then Superman steps back, pats Perry's arm. Smart man, keeping her around. <clears throat> Lois suppresses a laugh as Superman looks at her again. We know how pained he is returning like this, but he's crazy about her. Superman then takes off into the sky. People yell after him, loving him. Drivers honk their horns. It's like seeing every great sports figure all of, the, of all time rolled into one. At the height of their career, only airborne. Perry's eyes are on the sky. Lois is too. She's smitten. Exterior space night, the ruser. Its speedy trajectory passes us as we pan with it, revealing Earth in the distance. And we match cut the actual planet too. Exterior, the daily planet night. The silver deco globe atop the skyscraper. Interior, the daily planet night. The back of a computer. Then, after a moment, Clark peers out from behind it and we see his point of view. Lois is at her desk, putting on lipstick. She's also wearing a dress. <laughs> Sexy, but still professional. Are you uh, going out tonight after your interview? Lois looks up at him, annoyed. What does that mean? What? Nothing. I'm just... No, I'm not going out. Am I dressed up too much? Is that what you're saying? No, I... I... Does it look like I'm trying too hard? Not that I am, but does it look like I am? Ugh, listen to me. Don't answer that question. What is it about him that makes you nervous? I'm not nervous. This is just an interview. I've done dozens of interviews. I know, but... He saved my life. And my job. And he can fly. Top that. I'm grateful. I'm indebted. I'm amazed. I, and I'm a woman. You wouldn't understand this. Jimmy does, but you don't. This guy, I don't care what planet he's from, is gorgeous, okay? I'm not nervous, I'm thunderstruck. So talking to him, no, it's not like sitting here talking to you. No offense, Clark, you're good looking, but this guy who I've known for less than a couple of days, he's made an impression. Clark looks at her resolute. He's about to tell her the truth. Lois? What? A tense moment. All Clark has to do is say it, but he doesn't want Lois to look at him differently because of Superman. So finally, quietly. Have a good interview. Thanks. With a sweet smile, she goes. Clark watches and sighs. Exterior, the Daily Planet roof night. High atop the Midtown Metropolis skyscraper, the silver globe lit by giant arc lights. A chilly breeze blows Lois's hair as she waits for Superman, her eyes scanning the sky. It's quiet and isolated and somehow romantic up here. Lois takes out a small digital voice recorder, hits record. Testing, test, test. She then hits stop and play and we hear her voice play back. Then she tries to get a look at her lipstick in the reflection of her recorder. We're tight on her as she senses something and looks up. Then she turns around, rack focused to reveal that Superman has landed just 10 feet away. She does everything she can to appear all business. Hello. Hi. Good. I'm glad you came. Me too. She catches herself staring at him then. So let's start. Before you ask, I don't know where I'm from or how I fly or see through steel. I don't know my real name or who my parents are. Pretty sure I'm the worst interview you're ever gonna have. I'll just ask my questions. If there's something you don't wanna answer or don't have the answer to, just say next question. Superman agrees. She hits record. Where do you live? Next question. 
Oh, come on. Seriously, next question. You said you can see through steel? Mm hmm Is there anything you can't see through? Lead isn't always so easy. Isn't so easy or you can't see through? Can't see through it. You said you don't know where you're from. Were you born on this planet? No. Concerned, she clicks off the recorder. Then you should know. There's a man who wants you dead. He looks at her, sort of falling deeper in love. He starts slowly moving towards her, drawn to her beauty, but embodying the strength of Superman, acting the part of the confident man for the first time. Yes, I'm familiar with Lex Luthor's work. And as he approaches, she slowly melts. Dr. Luther will be happy to read that I'm not the monster he's predicted. And now Superman is standing right in front of Lois, inches away, as if he's about to kiss her. The charge between them could supply all of Iceman's electrical needs for centuries. Looking up at him, she's almost breathless. He's the monster. There's something, an element that's poison and his hands move to her face, the most beautiful face he's ever seen. And he touches her gently saying, I can take care of myself. But before he could finish the statement, Lois is kissing him, arms wrapped around his head. Superman kisses her back, shocked, loving it. When suddenly she stops, horrified by her behavior, she hurries away from him, his back now to Lois. My God, oh, that was so not okay. Superman's head is down. He's smiling, blushing. Superman, can I call you Superman? I, I'm so sorry about that. You must get that a lot, huh? Not so much. Well, that was proof that Perry White is absolutely right about me. My judgment is off the charts. Your judgment is why I'm here. Don't underestimate yourself, Lois. Lois smiles. Hit records again. What does it feel like to fly? I think like you'd imagine, like surfing. Oh, you, you surf? No, but I imagine it feels like flying. He takes a step towards her, extends his hand. I'll show you. Sh show me what, flying? I. Well, you should be careful. I might just go insane and kiss you again. Like I said before, I can take care of myself. A beat. She takes his hand. She take, he takes her to the edge of the building. The camera moves above them, looking down to the street, 40 stories below. Oh, God. Hold on. Yeah, no kidding. And they step off the roof, and they're suddenly airborne. Exterior sky night, a montage as Superman and Lois fly through the skies. It's a miraculous flight through the city. Salome buildings racing just a few feet above the Metropolis River. She's amazed, laughing, and Superman is purely happy. Finally, Superman returns Lois to exterior, the Daily Planet roof night. He sets her down gently, the classic awkward post-date moment. Who's going to do what? Finally. Maybe we can do- Thanks some. for that. Another awkward moment then. So how do I um, get a hold of you? You want to get a hold of me? Yeah. I'll be in touch. Their eyes meet for a long beat. Then Superman turns and leaps into the sky. She watches him fly off, smiling so much she's almost laughing. Exterior Metropolis Day, next morning. Upbeat music blasts as Clark walks into, walks in with a definite in love bounce to his step. We'll never see Clark so full of joy. He passes a guy hawking Superman shirts. You want one? Got one. He passes a newsstand where Lois, Lois's interview is the headline. Superman speaks. Clark turns the corner, loving life. As he crosses the street, there's a sudden, deep, powerful, sonic boom. 
Windows shatter everywhere. People start running, screaming. Clark mind, Clark's mind races. What the hell could this be? Interior, the Daily Planet day. Dolly fast as Clark races through the office. Most people are gathered watching the bank of the televisions, reporting on the arrival of an alien craft in Washington, DC. Of course, we've seen the craft before. It's the Ruser. It sits in the middle of the National Mall in Washington, DC. All 12 stories of mech standing on three massive legs, motionless. What's going on? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Uh, this this thing just landed. Uh, it, it won Superman. Clark's brain twists in fear and dread. On one of the TV monitors, a breaking news banner with a videotaped view of the monster warrior, absolutely still in the middle of the mall. Helicopters hover high overhead. Police can be spotted in the area. What you're witnessing here is yet another mind-bending paradigm-shifting event. Whatever this machine is, it currently stands motionless in the National Mall of a nation's capital. The video zooms in on the Ruser, smoke wafting ominously from its tourist turrets. Phone, phone and television service has been disrupted as far away as Hub City with U.S. military and all major networks receiving this ongoing transmission. The news channel presents a new video window. It's mostly static, but the image is clear. It's the Superman S. Clark watches this, mind racing, heart sunk. He looks over at Lois, who watches equally horrified. He moves to her. Lois. And not now, Clark. And Lois hurries over to Jimmy, who stares at the screen, shocked. Find out everything you can about kryptonite. Okay. And she moves to Perry, who watches the screen, gripped by the vision. Mr. White, we need to talk. Mr. White! Perry's eyes finally find Lois. With his attention now, she hurries off. Perry follows. Clark watches her go, looking back at the TVs, knowing in his heart what he must do. Interior, the Daily Planet, main corridor day. Clark rushes to the 25th floor, main corridor. No one's here. So Clark sprints towards the floor to ceiling window at the end of the hall. And as he runs, the following, thi following happens in one shot. He rips off his clothes, transforms into Superman, takes off and smashes through the window, flying into the sky. A vacuum effect sucks his work clothes and anything else in the hall out the window after him. Interior Perry White's office day. Lois is there with Perry. She's wild with adrenaline, terrified over the Ruser's arrival and what that means vis-a-vis -vis Lex. Perry listens, concerned. This is exactly what Luther predicted would happen. Yes, I remember. Mr. White, I'm still pretty much a neophyte in this business. I don't know the people that you do. And yes, our job is to report the news, not influence it. But we also have to do the right thing. If Superman's taught us anything, it's that somehow. And I need your help with this. We have to stop Luther. Perry considers what to do. He grabs the phone, dials. Sir, the phones are dead. She's right. He hangs up, confides. There's a man named Stuart Sutton. He's a general. An old friend. He's at the Defense Department. I have to stay here with the paper. You should go and see him. Thank you. Okay. I'll need your car. What? No, 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 no. Use Jimmy's car. Sir, Jimmy's car is a moped. He stares at her, hating this. Finally, he picks up the phone, testing it. Nope, still dead. Finally, reluctantly, he tosses the keys to Lois as she heads out. Not a scratch. No, sir. Thank you. Interior parking garage day. Screech! Perry's red 2004 model Dodge Viper backs out of the parking space, crashing into another parked car. Lois winces horribly in the driver's seat. God. <sighs> she puts the thing in gear and screeches away. Exterior National Mall Day, the imposing ruser, rack focused to Superman as he lands, facing the Kryptonian's monolith of war, 200 yards away at the other end of the mall. We see the fear behind Superman's eyes. Nevertheless, here he stands, finding courage in the darkest corners. The hundreds of pedestrians cheer and applaud as Superman arrival, but he just stands there, his cape hovering behind him, moving slowly, a living thing, as we cut to. A pixelated image of Superman from the Ruser's point of view. A quick zoom out reveals most of the mall, then a quiet Kryptonian voice as before. Kryptonian is subtitled. 
closer. We pull back to reveal that we are interior choir Ruser control station night. Tizor strapped into the gyroscope controllers in the center of the chamber, hundreds of wires running from the gyro to command ports against the wall, which, above which are a series of large video screens which display a 360 degree remote view of DC, tight on Tizor's anticipating face as he whispers, Come to me. Exterior Na National Mall Bay, but for the moment, Superman remains motionless as he stares at the ruser. Our cameras whip into his eyes as we suddenly see what Superman sees. X-ray vision reveals the incredible robot robotic interior of the Ruser, what seems like thousands of miles of cabling, hundreds of tons of green gel fuel, every inch built for battle. And Superman calls out to the hundreds of onlookers, not urgent, but calm, protected, strong. Everyone, please leave this area well, the now. While the still hovering military choppers and handful of police cars remain where they are, the hundreds of onlookers sensing that something terrible is about to occur start to hurry off. Exterior Washington DC street day, the ruser stands tall and intimidating. Eight blocks away, pedestrians hastily make their way out of the central DC. And in this same shot, we pan with the pedestrians to reveal CIA agents Gray and Burke who stand staring at the ruser. Should we be concerned about this? Not if Loser's right. And uh, he's been right so far. Gray agrees. And so they turn, walking towards the Exterior National Aerospace Museum Day, where dozens of people look on, including a handful of museum administrators. Gray and Burke approach revealing their CIA badges. Excuse me. We're with the Central Intelligence Agency looking for Museum Director Diaz. Of course, none of the administrators can take their eyes off the ruser, including 55-year-old museum director Diaz. Yeah, that's me. Sir, we need to talk. It's a matter of national security. And Diaz look at Burke puzzled, and an increasing high-pitched roar becomes. Exterior expressway day. Lois driving Perry's Viper fast as hell. The car's engine redlined screaming as she's somewhat spastically steers the car, whips past the D Washington DC 10 miles road sign. And we see that she's the only car on her side of the road. There's an impossible traffic on the other side of the expressway. Everyone desperate to leave DC. Exterior National Mall Day. The place is mostly abandoned now, except for Superman and the three-legged 120 foot mech warrior, which looks like it could kill anything in an instant. The distant hovering choppers just watch and wait. Finally, Superman starts walking forward and we, interior choir, ruser control station, night, pushing in on Ty Thor as he watches Superman moving now. Ty and Zor smiles. The expectant crunch stretch sounds of, Zithor's, of Ty Zor's gloves as he gets better grip on the ruser's control. Exterior National Mall Day, with a slow, strong gait, Superman moves toward the Ruser, his heart pounding as he approaches. Interior choir, Ruser control station, night. Even tighter on Tizor, whose heart pounds just as hard. Keep going, keep going. Exterior National Mall Day, but then, as if sensing something, Superman stops. Interior choir, Ruser control station, night. Tizor stiffens. Exterior National Mall Day. As Superman considers his next move, we suddenly hear, Superman! And Superman looks, a woman, a bystander, a fan, runs towards him, 50 yards away between him and the ruser, with a piece of paper and a sharpie. Idiot. Can I get you to sign this? Ma'am, get away! But she doesn't stop. Superman's eyes widen. Interior choir, ruser's control station night. Tizor zeroes in on the woman with his weapon sights crosshairs. Exterior National Mall Day, Superman yells, Get out of here! And as one of the Ruser's terror pivots suddenly, back to focus on the fucking insane woman who keeps running for him. It's for my daughter, she loves you. But before she's done with the request, Superman has flown like a bullet to the woman, whisking her back at the very moment that Tizor flies, fires. 
The roots are unleashing an earth shaker, sh uh, earth shaking blast that blows a 30 foot deep hole in the ground of the National Mall. People everywhere scream and run. Interior National Aerospace Museum Day. A massive museum hall, various collections of space paraphernalia. Agents Gray and Burke walk with Director Diaz, who freezes at the not so distant rumbles. Suddenly, a museum guard runs past them, frightened out of his mind. They're fighting! It's the end of the world! And suddenly, Diaz's flight reflexes take hold and he just runs off full of fear. Gray and Burke look at each other. Uh, should they run too? Get that rock and then we get the hell out of here. Smash cut to Interior National Airspace Museum Rock Collection Day. A glass case of precious space rocks shattered by bullets push in on a particular green rock the size of a softball. Kryptonite. Burke reaches in, grabs it. In an instant, the two agents haul ass out of the museum, muffled thunder sounds becoming. Exterior National Mall Day. The Ruser steps forward. Each time one of the Ruser's 20 foot high, 100 ton feet slam into the ground, it rocks buildings across the Potomac. Interior Quar Ruser Control Station night. Tizor is now in full operation mode. His heads up display fully illuminated now. The gyroscope in motion. Exterior, Washington, D.C. Street Day. People running everywhere. Superman drops off the shaken autograph woman two blocks away, then turns and heads back. Exterior, National Mall Day. Superman flies above the mall as the monstrous ruser moves for him, blasting its powerful rapid-fire guns. Superman darts through the sky, avoiding the terrible, terrifying onslaught. Interior, Quar, ruser control day. We dolly fast around Tizor as he attacks madly, the gyroscope turning and blinking as the ruser moves. Exterior, Calvin CIA facility day. Boom down from an American flag to reveal, reveal an isolated two building military base. And the words appear, Calvin Research Facility, Jitters, Virginia. And Lex Black Sedan pulls to the security gate. The 19 year old utility guard, military guard sees Luther who flashes his ID credentials. Suddenly the guard is severely awkward. Hey, uh, Dr. Luther, I'm sorry. They, um, Director Dressler sent a memo that you're not allowed in the facility. The guard meekly holds up a copy of the memo. Luther looks at him with eyes of pure evil, his voice oddly calm. Open the gate. Now the guard's terrified. Uh, no, sir. And on Lex about to pounce, as the sudden shocking sound makes us jump out of our seats. Was that a gunshot? What the hell was that? We cut to the memo, fitting, flitting to the ground, blood splattered. Exterior National Mall Day, the ruser walks fast, blasting madly into the sky. Superman dodges the nonstop munitions as he flies in an arc in the sky and dives back towards the ruser, just arriving to get to the, just trying to get to the damn thing. And just as he approaches, interior choir ruser control station night. The gyroscope spin turns as we counter move and Tizor blasts away, hitting the hellfire trigger and exterior national mall day. White hot fire belches from the ruser's flame turrets. Superman is engulfed in his flame that is set back. Interior choir, ruser control station night. Tizor expertly turns and fires again. Exterior national mall day. This time, the ruser's gun blast hits Superman and he's thrown back powerfully four blocks. And exterior Washington DC street day, Superman slams uncontrollably into the facade of a DC building. He stops for a moment, shocked, for the first time in his life, facing a physical threat potentially stronger than he is. Superman gets his bearings, finds his resolve, and takes off again, back to the National Mall. But we stay here, booming down fast as Perry's Viper screeches around a corner and comes to a cockeyed stop. Lois jumps out of the car and runs into the Defense Department building across the street. Interior Defense Department operating office day. It's mayhem here. In many ways, this is a sister C 
scene to the military panic we witnessed on Krypton. Only now, Katazor's forces threaten Earth. A dozen frantic military personnel come on stat phones, arguing over protocol and procedure. Among those is the fray is Stuart Sutton, 62, large gray-haired four-star general who argues with one of the president's military advisors. We have three dozen F-22 standing by to scramble. If we don't jump on this now, we will lose our window. The president is not prepared to take that action. There are civilians in this city. As they argue, Lot Lois enters the room. Spot Sutton. General Sutton. The president will not risk military action in the capital until... There's not going to be a capital or a country if we don't move on this. And what in the hell are you suggesting? God save me, I want to bomb the National Mall. General Sutton! Lois Lane, reporter at the Daily Planet. I work with Perry White. Well, I have no comment. How the hell did you get in here? Sir, I'm not here as a reporter. I came because of Superman. Someone is trying to kill him. Let me guess. Is he a 150 foot tall robot? Someone get her out of here. A, a security guard approaches, taking her, pulls her away. Sir, you have to listen to me. It's Dr. Lex Luthor. He says that he recovered an alien body that, please, if we don't stop Luthor, Superman could lose this fight. And just as she's out the door, we hear. Hold it. The guard stops, Lois, too. Sutton turns. Dessler, Lex's former boss, is here too. He moves to her. What'd you say about Luther? Interior Luther's lab day. The lights come on with a clang as Lex Luther enters his now empty main research lab, a large room with many analysis desks. At the center, however, is a familiar pod. Lex begins working the alien craft controls. The thing lights up like a view from Mulholland as Lex works we Exterior National Mall Day. Superman flies around the Ruser, which turns to keep him in view. The various gunfires blasting past Superman into the surrounding buildings and grounds, making rubble of much of the surrounding area. Interior Choir Ruser Control Station Night. Tizor turns, firing close on Tizor. This is personal. Exterior National Mall Day. The Ruser belches more fire. Superman uses his breath to whip the fire away. Then he flies up. Gun traces, traces trailing him, and he heads for the top of the ruser. Superman gets a grip on the head, tries to push it over, actually starts to, but interior choir ruser control station night. Tizor tilts on the gyro. He's visibly surprised at Kal L strength. Tizor hits controls and exterior national mall day. Superman pushes hard against the mega chine as suddenly on the ruser, Armor panels around him retract and two dozen turrets shift into view. Superman's eyes go wide in the instant before they all fire, hitting Superman fiercely, throwing him back. Superman lands on the lawn of the mall, disoriented as the giant ruser steps hungrily towards him. Interior choir, ruser control station night, the gyroscope in aggressive motion as ruser lumbers towards Superman, going in for the kill. Exterior National Mall Day, and just as things seem to be upon him, Superman shakes off the daze, looks up, and flies away just as a massive blast eviscerates the ground he was just sat upon. Superman now flies towards the Washington Monument, luring the ruser, which gives chase, all three legs running prodigiously as if after its airborne enemy. Superman flies to the middle of the reflection pool. He lands in the knee-high water, quickly turns back, his cape whipping around behind him. He watches as the ruser walks into the water, each step a huge splash. Interior choir, ruser control station night. Tizor remotely hurries towards Superman, firing. Exterior national mall day. Munitions blast in the water as the ruser approaches. Superman flies forward, diving under the water. Interior reflection pool day, we're underwater as Superman, bol as Superman bullets through the shallow water towards his mechanical enemy. Interior choir, ruser control station night, Tizor's disoriented, having momentarily lost Superman. Exterior national mall day, 
Suddenly, Superman bursts from the water directly underneath the Ruser. He rockets upward, slamming powerfully into the belly of the thousand ton tripped. The Ruser lurches forward. Interior Quar Ruser Control Station Night, and Tizor feels the impact. He is unnerved. He tries to counter Superman's might, but exterior National Mall Day. Superman heaves within everything he's got, actually yelling. It's such a struggle. Just as the ruser seems to avoid a fall, Superman throws the thing down in the other direction. The massive ruser turns sideways and crashes into the side of a titanic splash into the reflection pool. Into your quad ruser control station night. The gyro, the gyro spends Tizor violently horizontally. Exterior National Mall Bay, the Ruser's three legs lamely scrabble to get footing, but it's a pitiful and failing as Superman darts to one of the Ruser's colossal turrets, like the one we saw years ago aimed at Jor-El's head. Superman begins pulling on the turret in an attempt to bend the enormous gun barrel. It's perhaps the hardest thing he has ever had to do, but finally the turret begins to bend, to bow. Interior Quar Ruser Control Station Night. Still sideways, but refusing to give up, Tizor fires madly at Superman again. Exterior National Mall Day. But firing with the choke turrets is suicide. A section of the Ruser erupts from within and a horrifying internal chain reaction begins. Superman flies off as the Ruser self-destructs spectacularly. And Superman lands at a distance, watching gratified as interior choir ruser control station night all the activity lights and video monitors go dim no sound either pushing on a defeated tizor motionless with rage a volcano about to explode the three section portal separates and the female kryptonian alta enters saying in kryptonian we've got a signal from earth and as Tizor turns to her, of course, we already know, it's Lex Luthor calling, and we prelap. He's dangerous. Interior Defense Department, Operation Office Day. There's, the room is still in mayhem. Lots of noise that the fight is over, and we're moving quickly around Lois, Dressler, and Sutton. I suspected that from the beginning. Yes, he's a brilliant researcher. He's earned more degrees than the rest of my department combined, but Luthor is not your average guy. He's worse than that. He's an irrational, power-hungry, paranoid, misogynist. I've heard from you. We've got bigger problems than Luther. We might not. His division was black ops, no oversight. Luther had total autonomy. He might have an alien corpse. Kryptonite might cause them harm. If Luther believes destroying Superman means world domination, the smartest move we could make is putting Luther out of business. Sutton looks at Lois and old, tough scrutiny. Finally, Lois just nods at him as if to say, he's right. Just then, an aide hurries over, another emergency. Sir, uh, I know there are other issues, but um, three guards were just found dead at the Kelvin lab. Dressler takes this in, turns to Sutton, certain. It was Luther. Exterior National Mall Bay, an ad... Advocate, heartbreaking score plays as we fly over the ruins of the National Mall. Through the major monuments stand some surrounding buildings don't. The place has sadly been transformed into a war zone. Then we land on the lawn where large burning ruser chunks litter the place as Superman walks through looking for the people in trouble. He spots a man helping another wounded man to his feet. As Superman approaches them, the man sees him coming and they back away from Superman as if Superman were suddenly someone they didn't trust. Yeah, we don't need your help. We're okay. Superman doesn't understand, but the two men move off. Then Superman turns. Three women stand nearby, staring at him, disturbed. He approaches. Are you all right? But in revealing slow motion, the woman nervously turns and walks away, still in slow-mo. We're tight on Superman's face as it occurs to him. These people are blaming him for what's happened here. Finally, we, we fade in, pre-lap. Uh, 
as the world begins to ask the real question, a hero at what cost? Interior TV monitor day. Our mournful score continues as we're tight on a TV monitor displaying a door news broadcast. Certainly the events today in Washington, D.C. bring to the forefront concerns that some have had since the Superman first appeared. Can the world <coughs> afford to blindly trust this stranger? Does he bring light to our planet or darkness? The report continues as our music darkens, grows urgent and aggressive as we dolly back to reveal that we are Interior Kelvin CIA Facility Day. It's a small TV in the now dead military guard shack, his lifeless hand in the foreground as four Humvees roar, roar through the front gate. Various shots as a military SWAT team jumps from the vehicle and surrounds the facility. Precision, stealth, manpower, lethal semi-automatic weaponry. In under 15 seconds, this place is bordered with the best shots in the business. Three dozen HK machine pistols and Pancor automatic shotguns leveled at every possible access point. Team leader Duras takes cover, quietly radios. Bravo team, move. We want Luther alive. Dolly low and fast as six full gear, full gear team members rush into interior Kelvin CIA facility day. Handheld and fast moving as we follow the team into the narrow dark halls of the compound, the tension unbearable. Exterior Calvin CIA facility day. The rest of the team holds position and we find that Lois is here too, remaining in the passenger seat of one of the parked Humbers. Dressler beside her, beside, behind the wheel, she talks quietly into her voice recorder. The remaining 20 odd military SWAT team members remain absolutely motionless, a display of their masterful training. She hits pause, eyes on the building, then. You did good. She glances at Dressler, then shares a smile. It's nice to have an ally. Just then, gunshots coming from inside the building, lots. Bravo team, do you copy? Bravo team, this is Alpha Leader, do you copy? But there's no answer. With Jarrah's tense, the rest of the team on edge, the sounds of gunfire continues until finally, silence. Lois's eyes dart around the facility, dressers visibly nervous too. The team members tense as the facility's main doors open. The SWAT team cocks so many guns that it sounds like a flock of birds taking flight. And with all eyes in the open door, someone steps out of the building, but it's not the bad guy you were expecting. Ty Zor walks out, exceedingly calm. Lois watches, confounded. Jarris grabs his bullhorn. You've trespassed on a federal property. We are authorized to use lethal force. Stop right there. Put your hands on your head. And Tizor does stop, except the other three Kryptonians step out of the building. Alta, the female, who be the hottest girl in town, except she destroyed the town. And the two males, Baz Al and Ka'an. The four Kryptonians, all dressed in dark body armor with ancient Kryptonian ninja style vestments, complete in what appears to be sword sheaths, are the oddest sight Still somehow, the whole military SWAT teams know they're in trouble. A bead of sweat drops from Jurassic's forehead. Lois stares, stone still. And Tizor, his eyes scanning the area, seems oddly pleased, as if this ambush were just a speed bump along the Autobahn. We're tight on his face as he crosses his eyes, inhales deeply, tilts his head back as if in ecstasy. The SWAT team watches, but damn it, Dross has had enough. All right, hands on your... But Zizor suddenly whips from his sheath his three-foot-long composite weapon, the Blastif, twirls in a blur and fires a terrifying death ray that incinerates Dross and blows up the Humvee beside him in a shocking fireball. Lois screams. The SWAT team fires at them, but the bullets bounce off of them, falling to the floor with thousand metallic clinks. The, the team scatters now, it's insanity. Dressler fumbles with the Humvee keys, drops them. Lois ducks in the vehicle as Alta, Bazal, and Ka'an join 
Tai Zor in the ferocious attack, leaping into the sky, twirling their deadly blast staffs like jujitsu snipers, blasting the retreating team members with cruel death rays, annihilating the entire SWAT team from the sky. Lois sees Tizor swoop down and turn towards her Humvee. She looks at Dressler, still scrambling with the keys. There's no way he's getting them in. She opens her door and jumps out of the Humvee. We move with her fast as she runs. The Humvee is hit with a devastating death ray as soon as she is 10 feet away. The vehicle explodes and we're tight on Lois as she sprints, terrified beyond belief, as suddenly Alta lands in front of her. Lois screams. But then as a reflex, roundhouse kicks Alta, whose head barely turns. The descent for a human, mm, the descent for a human kick has only one effect. It makes Alta smile. She grabs Lois by the hair, brings her to her knees, raises and twirls her blast if about to blow off Lois' head when. Not her. Alta looks up as everything stops. Lex walks out here amid the rubble, his shoes crunching on gravel, the whole SWAT team now deceased. He moves to Lois, smiles, his affection with the others just where he always wanted it. Affiliation with the others just where he always wanted it. That would be a waste. Interior, the Daily Planet Day. The busy newsroom moved fast with Perry as he barks orders to the three reporters who follow him through. No, 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 I want all four DC photos on the cover. We need more testimonials and I want the headline to make the point. Should we trust the Superman? But before Perry can finish, he stopped talking and walking and the newsroom slowly goes silent. All eyes trained on the same thing. Superman stands on the outside ledge, having just landed. The whole newsroom has a fearful, awkward reaction as if Superman carried some kind of disease and was potentially infectious. Truth is, there might be another ruser coming and no one here is looking to die. Superman opens the window and enters the office, walking through the space, silent stares, and Superman eyes the place, knowing he's not wanted. Doesn't blame a soul. Lois here? A long silent, then silence, then finally, no. Superman looks to him. Then something catches his eye. One of the TV monitors airing world news 24 seven, showing protesters in England burning images of Superman's S in effigy, pumping into the air handmade signs reading, go home. Superman looks away, leans against the desk, black lit by the windows. The image reminds us of a burdened Kennedy in the Oval Office. In fact, Jimmy Olsen can't help himself. He takes a few snaps. Superman's heart is broken, though truly that's his last concern. He says not facing anyone in particular. If I'd known I had such enemies, I would never have come here. Please just tell the world I'm leaving. They never meant to do anyone harm, but I hope my going away saves the planet. A beat. Finally, Perry just nods, then... One more thing I'd like you to tell Lois. But just before Superman's about to speak, he begins to hear a deep, frightening, guttural shriek. Superman turns, the hell is that? And soon we recognize the voice and name as it travels from the far across the globe, echoing through time. Ah! <sighs> Superman at the window, he looks out, we're tight on Superman's face as another horrible sound is heard, some kind of massive destruction and he knows he can't leave just yet. Superman takes off instantly and exterior sky day. Superman flies faster than he ever has, his face racked with concern, fear of what's ahead. And he flies through the time zone shifting to night and exterior Giza pyramids, Egypt night. As Superman arrives, he finds one of the Great Pyramids being blown apart by Alta, Bazel, and Khan. Stones in place for thousands of years cast into the sky like dry leaves by the mega gale force breath of Tizor's team. Superman bullets through the sky for them. The three see him coming, 
have expected him, and as Superman grabs Khan in midair, Khan answers with a sudden, majestic, martial arts skill which stuns Superman. The following happens in mere seconds. Baz Al spins Superman around. This guy is wicked though, wicked tough. Superman tries to fight back, but Baz Al triple roundhouse kicks Superman over to Alta, who is perhaps the deadliest of the bunch. She works him hard, sending Superman spiraling towards the earth. He lands in the desert below painfully, impossibly hard, some blood, his suit slightly damaged. We're tight on Superman as he begins to recover, horrified at their power when we hear in English. Hello. And Superman looks up at Tizor, who's standing above him. Cousin. Before Superman can think, Tizor has smiled and taken off. Superman gathers all the strength and blasts after him. Exterior sky night, Superman rips through the sky. Above the high cloud layer, he stops, hovering. His eyes ferociously scan the night sky. It's incredibly beautiful up here, by the way. A silent, precious haven. Interrupted by sounds of distant, erratic, erratic church bells and amid horrible devastation. Superman's head whips towards the sound, terrified. He bullets to. Exterior Paris night, a horrific sight. Notre Dame collapses. Alta, Basel, and Cayenne, having just blown the structure to fiery shards with their blastiffs, they're now lifting cars with people inside and hurling them against buildings. And suddenly Superman tackles Basel hard, punching him powerful numerous times. But when Basel fights back, it's a wicked display of superhuman strength. Still, Superman continues to fight, even as Alta and Cayenne join the fray. But Superman is no match for them, especially when Bazel and Khan hold Superman up for Ty Zor, who lands just and just begins punching the hell out of Superman. Imagine a bar brawl between a decorated sergeant, sergeant and a new recruit. After a dozen painful blows, this plummeting, plummeting, plummeting just becomes sad, just like my reading. Tizor ends the tirade with a devastating kick, sending Superman tumbling. Exterior sky, night, day. As Superman propelled by the abysmal power of Tizor across the entire Atlantic Ocean and exterior Gotham City, day. Superman crash lands violently in the American city. Cars and pedestrians scatter as Superman, essentially a horrifying projectile, rips up a city block as he lands finally stopping in front of the Gotham City Library. Superman is bloody now, suit torn, exhausted, in agony. Superman then hears a deafening crash sound, summoning energy he doesn't have. Superman takes off again and exterior Gotham City day. We're back where our story began. Tizor has just destroyed the network skyscraper. Superman lands two blocks away. We now, of course, understand the battered look. They face off, then Tizor lifts off the pavement and blasts into the sky. Superman ferociously pursues. We see a quick, quicker cut version of the frenzied Mitch Air martial arts battle we saw before, this time with different camera angles. And they shalom buildings, battle and chase. Tizor is thrown into the construction crane. It crashes as before into streets below. Tizor uses the crane, hitting Superman with it. Superman reels, crashes through two buildings, which, unlike the opening, we now see from the outside of the buildings. Superman then goes after Tizor again, chasing him through the sky. Exterior Cape Canaveral Day. Superman lands, searches, interior NASA testing area day. Superman enters the large, long, dark corridor. It's a dead end, but there are a dozen doors here. Tizor is here somewhere. Superman stares down the hall. Then the whisper. Cal. Where is this quiet voice coming from? Yeah, that was. It's almost like we're human, isn't it? Superman powerfully rips off each door, moving through the place door to door. He finally rips off one door that makes him stop or tight on his face his eyes wide with terror as, at what he sees, and Superman almost gasps. No. And this time, 
we see what we didn't see at the beginning, lying at the bottom of one of those giant water sealed testing tanks is Lois Lane. Her hands bound behind her back, her feet bound together. She's been in the water for close to a minute now, her life slipping away. And sitting in the tank in front of her is kryptonite. Overcome with deep pain from the kryptonite, Superman crashes to his knees, sinking into the concrete floor like it was soft sand. An agonizing, confusing moment. What the hell is happening to me? His head hangs low. He tries to crawl forward, but it's so painful. I want to hear you cry, kal like your mother cried. Cry for me. Superman. And Superman finally looks up, his face covered in repulsive blister rash, his eyes rolled back in bloodshot, and Superman screams. And Lois sees Superman, bubbles escaping from her mouth. She shakes her head at him, her yells muffled underwater. No, good work! But Superman struggles to crawl towards her, the devastating effects of kryptonite killing him. Lois struggles, desperate to turn Superman away. She's crying underwater now, knowing that he's coming to save her, knowing what exposure to kryptonite will mean. We dolly with Superman as he strains to the wall of glass, the deadly green rock and the woman he loves submerged in water behind it. As their lives slip away, Superman pulls his arm back and pounds the glass, but his powers are gone now. In fact, He's so weak now that any of us could have hit the glass harder. Lois ferociously shakes her head, the less oxygen bubbling from her mouth. Superman pulls his arm back and strikes the glass again, then again, but the blows are pointless. He leans against the glass, crying himself, his life force depleted. Their eyes meet, two souls on the verge of death. We're tight on their eyes as Superman gathers every ounce of strength he has got left and slow motion pulls his arm back and with immense power slams it into the glass, which shatters the water, the rock, and Lois rush out of the tank into the room, thrusting Superman back. Lois lies on the ground in shock, inhaling desperately and coughing water from her lungs. She looks up. Superman lies blistered battered and motionless, the kryptonite rock on the ground near him. Crying and out of breath, Lois grabs the shard of glass and uses it, using it behind her back, she cuts the rope that binds her. She scrambles for the kryptonite, grabs it and throws the rock and lands far from them in the doorway. Lois takes Superman's heavy, lifeless body in her arms, tries to awaken him as she cries. Superman, please, please, Superman please. But her cries go on, I am answered. And finally, drained and joyless, her head just drops to his chest, to his shredded S, the image of strength and truth and all that is right, having been destroyed by an unimaginable darkness. Full back to a long shot, Lotus, Lois cradles Superman, the kryptonite rock in the foreground, after a moment, a hand comes into frame and picks up the green rock. And we see that it's Agent Gray. He places the kryptonite into a lead case, locks it, and looks at Tizor, enters the room, pleased at what he sees. He sim says simply, His heart is stopped. And Lois looks up, looks at Tizor with red, wet, lost eyes. Tizor appears calm, satisfied. You can see it. Tears just stream down her face, her rage building too. But what can she do? Then her eyes flick to see Lex Luthor move in beside Tizor, proudly surveying the scene. He then moves to soaking, crying, devastated Lois. He pulls out a handkerchief, holds it out for her. Take it. Looks like it's your... Looks like it's yours already. She looks at it, the LL monogram. She hates Lex so much in this moment, but all she can do is sob, holding Superman. 
Lex drops the handkerchief, which we watch in slow motion as it drops through the air, landing on Superman's dead, wet face. And interior jor cell night. jor his face ravaged by age and abuse, suddenly awakens alone in his cell. No sound has awoken him, no touch or prodding, but rather a sense, an emotional innate understanding, a truth which transcends time and distance. In this moment, jor simply knows that his son is dead and his eyes go wide. His mouth opens in a long, silent, breathless shriek and jor begins to cry a physical pain worse than any he has ever endured. Smash cut to interior Koba Palace night today. Katazor screams in celebration, alone this enormous space. He <laughs> twirls, laughing, picking up a glass of liquor and hurls it joyously against the wall. <clears throat> it shatters as he turns to a fluid clock-like video monitor where Tizor's image is seen and Kryptonian almost giddy. I'll be sure to tell Jor-El. Exterior Cape Carnarvon Day. As Tizor, Alta, Bazel, and Kayan walk cocky amid the ro- rockets and shuttles, Lex and Agent Gray and Bur- Burke travel, trail them, some 30 feet behind. Gray holding the lead kryptonite case. Tizor, feeling particularly audacious, holds out his die-sized community communicator attached to his cloak with a retractable cord. One who helped, Lex Luthor. He's asked for something in return. Anything, give him anything. He wants the planet. Earth? Give it to him, anything. Yes, sir. When you're done with Earth, we'll celebrate. Tizor lets the communicator retract as he, as he turns back to Lex. So, are we good? We are good. Exterior Arlington National Cemetery Day, a heart-rendering music chord. Our score begins simply and sadly and plays over images of this gray day. Drizzle black umbrellas, umbrellas. mourners, faces of real people, friends parents, sons and daughters, grandparents, tears from those who in this mad world might just lost the hope they ever had. Not hundreds of people, not thousands, literally millions of mourners, many still arriving by car, by bus. They have all come today for Superman's funeral. A hand strewn red cape with the yellow S draped over the coffin. Close up of flowers and cards, many written by school children. And over this, we begin to hear an amplified, sorrowful voice. Why are we here this minute, standing in the rain, honoring a man we hardly knew? Why are we here? Then we see Lois. She stands at a podium, bandage, in black, facing the unbelievable sea of people. I don't know. Maybe it's because we'd forgotten. Self, selflessness looked like honesty, kindness to people who could never return the favor. True spectacle, majesty, and courage. Maybe it's because we'd forgotten what it felt like to be safe. When I was small, when I'd have trouble falling asleep, my father knew he'd come, knew to come to me, kneel by my bed and look into my eyes calm and constant. The President of the United States is there with his family holding hands, Perry White and Jimmy and millions we don't know. He'd offer his hand and I'd hold it, my small fingers wrapped around his. And as she continues, we cut to interior Yispa concentration camp night as Katazor walks haughtily down the halls of the horrific camp, entourage behind him and we hear, I wouldn't tell him about the monsters I feared or why the darkness made me afraid. And as Lois continues, we cut to interior Jor-El cell night. We push in on Jor-El as he sharpens a piece of stone on the ground, his eyes wet and determined, a man on a sublime mission. I didn't have to. 
Looking into his eyes, I was understood. And I was safe. Exterior, Arlington National Cemetery Day. As Lois continues, Superman's coffin is buried in the earth. I looked into Superman's eyes too, up close. And I saw that same understanding, that same calm and constancy. I saw goodness. Robert Kennedy once said, it is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. And amid the mass of mourners, a bus stops and a woman gets off. An older woman who we recognize as Martha Kent, her face long and pale, she is alone so far away from her son's coffin. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. These people, these countless people, their faces running the gamut of color and shape, their hearts all heavy with the inconsolable loss. Interior Yispa concentration camp night, Katazor turns a corner, getting closer to his brother's cell, almost smiling in anticipation of delivering the news. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which we can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Interior jor cell night. jor kneels on the ground, shirtless, holding the now sharpened stone angled towards his belly, his eyes set forward, wide with the horror of what he's about to do. Maybe that's what we saw in Superman. Maybe that's why we're here today. And suddenly, jor jabs himself with the stone, resisting the pain, ripping the thing across his body. We're tight on his face for the most horrific part, but we're all witness to what seems like simply a man's suicidal reaction to the heartbreaking news that his son has perished. Interior Yispa concentration camp night, and Katazor moves into the cell block, which houses jor -El. As he heads down the hall, ready to make his big announcement, he sees blood pooled outside his cell, Katazor grows concerned as he approaches, finally arriving at the cell and finding jor -El dead. Lying in a large red puddle and with Katazor's daunted eyes filling frame, we hear. As safe as I once felt, I'm now that afraid. Afraid of what's next. Exterior, Arlington National Day Cemetery. As Lois continues. We've seen protesters people chanting for Superman to go away. Well, now he has. And so perhaps the question isn't, why are we here? But rather, who are we going to be? Now that Superman is gone. The music ends and we cut from Lois, Lois tear streaked face to whiteness, blinding, a distant rushing sound as if, as if this place were somehow womb-like we only see a light, but we'll call this exterior infinity timeless. And it's not really a place at all. There are no boundaries here, no edges, no beginnings, no endings. It's as much a journey as it is a location. You are alone here and yet you cannot be alone here. Then we see a speck of something so far away, it's impossible to make out at first. And we just hold on this image, allowing us to finally realize it's Superman. He walks towards us, placid and composed, his suit restored to pristine condition, his scars and blisters gone. Note, this should not be true slow-mo, but there should be an otherworldly quality to this moment. I think 40 frames per second, rather specific. And we're tight on Superman as he walks somehow drawn forward, his eyes searching this place. Not at all alarmed, but not at all comfortable. Then he passes us, we hear. Hello. And Superman stops, turns, standing 20 feet away from him in this faceless space is jor -El. Dorel still at 69 is dressed in the monarch monarchal robes, 
he was wearing when you first met him. He looks handsome again, imperious. Superman stares at this, recognizing him from his mother's ph photograph, and Superman is stunned. At first, too shocked to move. Finally, emotional, uncertain, quiet. I know you. Jor-El's eyes well with tears, though he remains as strong and composed as ever. And I know you. You are my son. Superman steps towards him, now ten feet away. He dares not move closer, his mind tumbling. Your cousin and the others are still on Earth. They must be stopped. Your destiny depends on it, and the destiny of millions. My, my destiny? Your home planet is called Krypton. It is a place undone by civil war. It is a prophecy, an ancient Kryptonian text that speaks of that war. It speaks of a prince whose fate was to be sent away, raised in another world. This young man would face a challenge. If prosperous, his destiny is to return to Krypton and free his people from the ravages of evil. Kal-El, you are that prince. I don't understand. You will. When you return, you will meet Hengra. He will be your guide. H how? How am I supposed to know what to do? Because you understand what is good. Because you understand what is evil. Because the Kents raised you, as we knew they would, with integrity and compassion. We traveled many years searching for a home for you hoping we would never have to send you away, yet knowing always that day would come. And Jor-El starts slowly towards Kal-El, having missed his boy so much. I can give my life for yours, but I know who I am. I cannot be the savior. That is your burden. That is your gift. Jor-El stands right in front of Kal-El, now, face to face, Superman is visibly afraid, quietly. What if I fail you? You could never fail me. Looking into Jor-El's eyes, it's almost as if Superman is comforted, calmed in a way that Lois just described. And Jor-El embraces his son. Superman embraces his father and a reverse, re Reverberated primal scream sound begins, start, sound begins, starts to grow. Interior coffin day, inside the dark coffin where Superman lies dead, battered and bloody, his suit torn, shredded. The reverse primal scream sound getting louder as we push in on Superman's corpse. The scream sound reaching a crescendo, crescendo and stops as suddenly Superman gasps. His eyes open. <gasps> we jump so much that we might not even realize in that instant, his skin is repaired, his suit restored. Exterior Arlington National Cemetery Day. Lois steps down from the podium. A somber choral hymn plays, church bells ring. Interior Underground Day, Superman fer ferociously burrows horizontally, through the earth, his expression intense and driven, his focus complete, his strength doubled, and in his eyes, the wisdom of a man who understands his destiny, a man who knows his purpose. Exterior Arlington National Cemetery Day, Lois, an emotional wreck, makes her way through the quiet mess of people, we're tight on her as she walks pale and hollow, then a hand on her sh shoulder and she turns to see. Oh, Clark Kent. He stands there somewhat pensive. Hello. And seeing him, somehow that's all she needs. And she just starts crying. Clark embraces her, holds her gently as the Kents taught him how touches her hair comfortingly and says softly, we'll be okay. But Lois is just lost. Into his chest, she says quietly, I don't think it will. I know this sounds egocentric and impossible, 
But I loved him. And as she cries, her face on his chest, one Clark who can't help but smile at the news. But after a moment, it's down to business. The reason he's here as Clark at all, he takes her by the shoulders. Lois, I think you know what killed him. Superman. What was it? A rock. I know. What kind of rock? It's called kryptonite. It was picked up years ago by a spacecraft. They took the piece away. Is there any more of it left? I don't think so. Oh yeah, there's more. And Clark and Loris turn to see Jimmy, who's standing there, eyes wet and red. Are you sure? Jimmy blows his nose, a rather large honk. Yeah, he, Lois asked me to research. Guys, this is so heartbreaking. Uh, I feel like hormonal. Clark holds him back. I need to know about the kryptonite now. Uh, a 600 pound rock was uh, picked up in space nine years ago. Uh, they, they did what they, they do with, with lots of rocks. Uh, they, they broke it up into pieces, sent it to countries all over the world, that, you know, and so they uh, could study it or whatever. Clark's mind racing, he turns to Lois. I have to go. And she stares into Clark's eyes and notices a strength she'd never noticed before. And just as she starts to consider this, Clark leaves fast. The hell was that about? Exterior sky day. Through the dark thunderclouds, Superman bursts into the sunlight, whips blisteringly fast through the sky, and interior United Nations General Assembly hall day. It's craziness in here, no order. Pockets of arguments between representatives of the world's nations paints a grim picture. There's no way we're going to figure this one out without some real help which is just what they were about to get. Excuse me. And everyone just stops, sees Superman standing at the double door entrance. In five seconds, it becomes an absolutely silent in here. Everyone looks at Superman, confounded. Didn't he just have the biggest funeral of all times? Maybe to prove that it's really him, maybe because there's no time to lose, Superman flies across the imposing, incredible room, landing in the center. Well, first thing, I'm not dead. Sorry for the confusion. Secondly, the four aliens who have destroyed so much of Earth are still on this planet, and they're ambitious. No one's going to like it if they get their way. Stopping them, however, is a job no one man, not even Superman, can do alone. I'm not political. I'm not here representing any one country, any one race. Today, I'm in this room. I'm just a man. And I can lead us to victory if you choose to follow. Interior TV monitor day, static. And then Lex Luthor, sitting behind a very familiar looking desk. Behind him are the Kryptonians as if standing guard. My name is Lex Luther, and I am speaking to you tonight from the White House. As you may have heard, there's been a transition of power in Washington. It wasn't easy. There were casualties. But as of now, I am your new president. Now, I'm sure you're asking yourself, so who is this man? Well, you'll get to know all about me. I'm full of surprises, I promise you that. And to those who might resist my rule, well, we all saw what happened in Egypt, in France, and Korea. No one wants more of that. So I'm here tonight to make a suggestion that you work with me. Superman is gone. But we have other visitors here now. I'm going to be working very closely with them. And I'll be talking to you soon about the changes ahead. This is an exciting time. I hope you agree. Good night and God bless. Then we see videotaped images of destroyed tanks, burning shells of aircraft. Outside the White House, military vehicles still burn. 
Then an image of Superman standing full body, a photo taken from his appearance in Boston. While hundreds of thousands remain at the site of Superman's funeral. The newscaster continue, continues, but Lois too saddened at the image of Superman hits her remote. The TV turns off, except we can still see Superman's image on the black screen. It takes Lois only a moment to realize it's a reflection. Lois turns, there he is, standing beside the open balcony window. Superman. Lois is stunned. Tears come to her eyes and Superman simply says, Hi. Eloquent. And they move to each other in embrace and kiss and our music builds as we cut to a montage. Note the key to this sequence is the unity of the world. It will all feel like one cohesive effort but carried out across the globe by two dozen countries. Of laboratories, scientists of very na various nationalities open storage cases containing glow green kryptonite. Of museums throughout the world, curators opening display cases with kryptonite. Cut quick cuts of various countries, air forces, missiles being dismantled, removed from fighter jets. Close up of kryptonite secured in medical clamps and under sterile conditions being broken into pieces. Military workshops where missiles are being reconditioned Holes being drilled into them. Kryptonite getting shaved into a bright green power, powder and Lois Lane in a laboratory ex examining a small kryptonite rock. She takes notes. Various multinational military personnel insert kryptonite powder, powder into their fighter jet missiles. This is the last piece of the montage as we cut to interior White House corridor night. As Agent Burke runs as fast as he can towards the West Wing, why, you'll see. Smash cut to interior off Oval Office night. Food containers scattered about, the place markedly disheveled. At a coffin table, Lex reviews a map of the world with Ty Zor, Alta, Baz Al, Ka'an, and Agent Gray. Luther says, his mouth half full with food. Then we take out the capital of every city. We start with Moscow, then Beijing, London, New Delhi. Interior White House corridor night. Burke scrambles around a corner, hauling ass. Interior Oval Office night. Cairo, Tel Aviv, Taipei. Oh, we should hit Paris again. Sir, sir excuse me. My uh, my sister's in Taipei. Well, you might want to call her. Suddenly, the doors burst open. It's Agent Burke. He's out of breath. Freaking iPads decide to freaking stop working. <laughs> Oh my gosh, troll in the dungeon. I'm just kidding. They're outside on the lawn. They rush to the window, standing out on the west lawn amid the, ru amid the ruin and still burning tanks, absolutely defiantly as Superman. He sees them and waves. Luther, Tizor, and the rest are shocked. No. Suddenly, Superman takes off. Tizor, Alta, Baz Al, and Kayan quickly follow, scattering, shattering through the Oval Office window. Exterior sky night today. As Superman bullets through the sky, pursued by Tizor, Alta, Baz Al, and Kaan, they fly into the daylight and Superman dives. Exterior Riziki Crater, Greenland Bay. And Superman's red boots land hard in the middle of the second largest crater on Earth made millions of years ago by some big motherfucker of a rock. Little did that rock know that it was creeping the ultimate bonking, bonking ring the four Kryptonians land a hundred yards away. They face off for a moment, four warriors against one, but this time Superman is fortified. He's received the Jor-El touch and he's here to win. Of course, Tizor has got the most invested here. His Kryptonian blood boiling. He rockets for Superman, who evades the light fast charges. Superman moves so swiftly that Tizor blows through his red cape like a frenzy bull and a master matador. Ole! Then Alta attacks, then Bazel and Ka'an. And what follows is a massive, violent, deliriously fast fight sequence on land and in the air. What makes this sequence different is different is that now Superman has the skills. He returns the force and powerful, 
powerhouse combos with equally versed moves, the fighting style that Jor-El demonstrated in Taza Palace. The Kryptonians whip out their blast staffs, twirling and firing in blinding fashion. In addition to fighting back hard, Superman avoids the pulse blast and almost precedent speed. Alta, Bazal, Khan, and especially Tizor are stunned by Superman's moves. Boom. Superman pounds Kion so hard that Kion drops his blast staff. Superman grabs it and blasts back at his opponent, pulling the blast staff apart and using each half as a separate martial arts blaster. Pew, pew. A truly ambidextrous soldier fighting two battles at once. But although he's the superior fighter, Superman once again outnumbered and Tizor Tizor gets in one especially cruel series of blows that sends Superman back 500 yards. He lands painfully and strains to stand, facing off with the Kryptonian Four once again. But this time, they all hear something, a strange approaching mega scale roar. And while Superman just stares straight ahead, chin down, eyes cocksure and determined, Tizor and the other three look around. What the hell is that sound? Where is it coming from? And we push in fast on Superman, who says quietly, Surprise. Suddenly behind Superman, a swarm of fighter jets, seemingly like a hundred of them, appear from over the horizon, and they blast hard, fast, and low overhead, unleashing their kryptonite lace shells at Tizor and his three associates. The Kryptonians scatter, taking off into the sky. So begins an impossibly fast air combat sequence between five Kryptonians and fighter jets from 24 nations. Missiles scream through the air, armed at Tizor, Alta, Bazal, and Ka'an, who perform mid-air acrobatics evasive maneuvers to avoid the bombs. Many of the bombs explode on the ground, and Tizor, Alta, and Bazal use their blasters to fire at the jets. A few of the jets get hit by the pulse blast and are destroyed by powerful explosions. Superman flies and air tackles Alta, an exchange of mid-air blows, and Superman slams her back just as she's hit by a Krypton Kryptonian Kryptonite missile. A wild explosion, and she's gone. In the flurry of blitz, Bazal and Ka'en also meet their demise, building to the final confrontation between Superman and Tizor, taking place on the crater floor. With jet fighters banking, roaring overhead, bombs exploding around them, it's a brutal exchange of blows, and while Superman seems to be the losing the battle, he finally rallies and beats Tizor badly enough that Tizor's on his knees. Superman looks up <coughs> and leaps into the sky as Hail a dozen missiles land on Tizor, blowing it into nothingness. Superman lands far from where the kryptonite bombs exploded. He falls to his knees out of breath, looking at the place where his mortal enemy once stood. And even though Tizor was evil and is now gone, somehow this moment is bittersweet. <sighs> Superman simply lowers his head into your Koba Palace night. Close up of a glass shattering on the floor, quickly, boom up to reveal the profile of the man who dropped it. It's Katazor. And as Jor-El knew once, so does he now. His son is dead. And Katazor's face is suddenly racked with alarm. Not so much sorrow that he's lost his son, but rather panic that the notorious prophecy might actually come to fruition that his day as a ruler may come, may be numbered. And as our music builds, we cut to exterior metropolis sky day. The music is sad now, like recollection. As Superman flies over the city, taking a moment to look down upon the city, the planet he's about to leave. Interior, the daily planet day. Our music continues over the busy newsroom. A headline, president reinstated. Lois moves to Perry, who leans over a desk, reading a front page story from a computer monitor as she pulls off her coat. What's the news on Luther? Military surrounded the right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, I had a frog in my throat. The White House, his agents are already in custody. Lois, this is good. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to ask. 
And then there's applause. Lois and Perry look up. Superman has just entered the office and all of the employees give him a standing ovation. Lois quickly drops her purse into her desk drawer and closes the drawer. As Superman modestly waves thanks to the people, Lois hurries to him. Hi. I need to talk to you. But she's pulling him out of the newsroom. We should go outside. Why? Trust me. Next year, the Daily Planet roof day. Our sorrowful music continues over a long shot of the roof, the giant iconic silver globe, a backdrop for Superman and Lois. Now we're close on them. He looks into her eyes, trying to find the way to say goodbye. And she gazes into his, searching hopefully for the thing he wants to say. What is it? This is truly hard for him, finally. I, I wanted to say goodbye. And her heart sinks. It takes her a moment. I don't understand. I'm going home. They need me back home. She looks at him through teary eyes, nodding, trying to be strong. She forces a smile. I sort of knew this would happen. But I'm coming back. Oh, good. Good, I hope so. But he touches her face, looks deep into her eyes. I'm coming back. For you. And she softens again, tears welling in her eyes. She's vulnerable again as she cries. He leans in and kisses her, and it's a long, romantic, wonderful kiss. Their goodbye. Finally, he pulls back, looks at her. Thank you for everything. She touches his face. No, thank you. They look into each other's eyes for a long moment. And just when you think Superman will turn to leave, a sardonic voice rings out. I like to thank you too, Miss Lane. Superman and Lois turn to see Lex Luthor walking towards them from the other side of the roof angry and spiteful. How else can a man find Superman so quickly? Superman turns towards him slightly in front of Lois, strong and impervious. You came for me, Dr. Luther? Well, yes, I did, Superman. Actually, I did. I came for you. I came here for you. Do you get it? Do you get the irony in that? Or have you not put it all together yet? Not to say that I'd blame you. I think I've done a pretty goddamn spectacular job. Luther's talking so hysteronically, it's unnerving. Like he's lost his mind a little. Like he's just uh, experienced the last straw. The good soldier, the loyal, the dedicated, the tenacious. That's me. When others would have quit, when others have, I kept up the shir charade, the charade following orders that made me sick, to impersonate the very thing I despise most in this universe that was like you. But Superman and Lois are befuddled as Luther continues. I was hoping to do this on a slightly larger scale, Superman, but here we are. And the only way for me to be the good soldier is to tell you the truth. No. That paw of the CIA recovered it wasn't yours. A long, insane, dramatic beat, and just as we get it. It was mine. Suddenly, shockingly, Luther leaps into the sky, airborne and super heroic. Like all of Luther's follows, Kryptonians are capable. Fellow Kryptonians are capable of. Superman and Lois, wide eyes, follow Lex fast across the sky, the two of them in pure shock. Go inside. Stay away from this. Go. Her eyes on Superman. Lois finally nods. She runs to the roof access door and Superman takes off. Interior, the Daily Planet stairwell day. Lois races down the stairs, determined. She busts through a door. Exterior, Metropolis day, and Superman attacks Lex. The battle we never imagined. 
Superman and Lex in airborne hand-to-hand -hand combat, and we're witness to the remarkable skills that Lex Luthor learned three decades, decades ago as one of Katazor's Krypton, Kryptonian soldiers. For Superman, this is like fighting against the sensei. Exterior Metropolis Street Day, pedestrians spot the battle and watch horrified. Interior, the Daily Planet Day, Lois races down the hall and into the office, hurries to her desk, pulls open the drawer she shut before. She scrambles through her purse and finds a glass vial holding the piece of kryptonite we saw her examining during the montage. Exterior Metropolis Day, Superman fighting skills are advanced, but Lex throws multi-combinations like we've never seen before. They hover around buildings like two pro boxers circling the ring. Interior, the Daily Planet Day. Lois, Lois, Lois races back up the stairs three at a time. Exterior, Metropolis Day. Superman and Lex exchange blows and they hear, Superman! Both Superman and Lex, who's closer to Lois, turns to see Lois back on the roof again. Lex smiles at Superman, then dives bomb for Lois. Superman flies after him. Lois is visibly scared as Lex rushes towards her. She's about to pull out the kryptonite when Lex grabs her and carries her off the roof and into the air. Now Lois screams, her plan gone awry. For a flash, Lex carries her with an evil intent, but then he feels the kryptonite pain, his skin starting to blister as he sees the vial of kryptonite that Lois holds. Lex loses his powers and they start to fall. Whew. Superman dives after them as a hurting Lex tries to wrestle the kryptonite away from her, but she won't let go. No, no. And just as they're about to hit the ground, Superman swoops down and grabs Lois, who drops the kryptonite. Lex slams into the asphalt three feet deep. You okay? Yeah. You? Yeah. Eloquent as always. Exterior Metropolis Street Day. Later, Lex, skin blotchy and in bad pain, lies whimpering in the back corner of the armored police van. Doors close on him. A cop talks to Superman, the armed van in the distance. Make sure you keep the kryptonite near him at all times. Yes, sir, we will. Swear to God. And the police move away. Superman turns to Lois. She just knows he's got to go. She nods. He moves to her, takes her in his arms, and they take off. Into the daily interior, the Daily Planet roof day. They land on the roof. One final look. <sighs> she wants to say something so badly, but she's too choked up. Finally, it's Superman who says, I love you too. Touched, she smiles. Just as it occurs to her, the only person she told her true feelings to was Clark. Uh, was this an assumption on Superman's part? And what was that strength she saw in Clark's eyes? A final look and Superman flies off, Lois watching him go, touched and intrigued. Interior Daily Planet Day. Lois walks in, still emotional, but her mind spinning. She finds Jimmy who stands there reading a letter, disturbed, sort of suspiciously, she says. Jimmy, is Clark around? No, he quit. Really? Yeah, said he's got stuff to deal with back home since the death of his father. And we're tight on Lois as she considers this. The man she loves, her soulmate, off on the greatest adventure of his life, and in this moment, she knows he'll be back. Exterior Kent Farm dusk, the most beautiful sight, the farm first, the farm we first saw 30 years ago, the sky pink, the musical score at once a heartbreaking resolution and a promise of things to come. And standing outside the farmhouse is Superman. He looks out at the land where he was raised, the land he's about to depart to face the ultimate challenge he takes a breath, exhales, bracing himself. Interior barn dusk, blackness, as we realize we're in an underground shelter inside the barn. Looking upward at Superman, he opens the swinging doors, looks down. Then we see what he sees, his pod. 
the one he arrived in so many years ago. Exterior Kent Farm dusk. Superman stands with his mother, Martha Kent. He embraces her, a woman once thought she lost her son. She now sees him in the greatest moment. They look into each other's eyes. Martha wipes away some tears, trying to sound strong, but her voice cracking. He's a sweetheart. And moments later, Martha Kent stands in her front yard as a brilliant light illuminates the farm. The pause thrusters showering the place in white light. And as our music rises, the pod lifts off, carrying Superman into the heavens, beginning the journey of his lifetime. And Martha Kent, watch, Kent watches as the light lifts into the sky, her heart full, proud of her son. Fade out. The end. Proud of your boy. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is JJ's Superman. We'll see y'all at the next one.